Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Carey with Church of the Eternal Logos, and I am joined today by the talented musician and Orthodox Christian, Neil DeGrade. How are you doing today, sir? Oh, I'm doing excellent. So glad to be here. Hey, I'm, I'm glad that you are here. Uh, and, and a major thank you goes out to John Hears for linking us up. Um, Love so that I, guy. I appreciate him being a mutual friend. Uh, to, he said, hey, you might want to you might want to have Neil on for a stream. Okay. And then I found your stuff over with Jonathan Paggio. Then I found your music that you sent me. Dude, I'm a fan. I'm a big fan of you and your wife. Uh, again, for those of you who aren't familiar, Neil and his wife um, are the musicians behind Dirt Poor Robins. Right. And uh, yeah. And maybe today we can listen to a little bit of your music while we while we stream and you can kind of give some context or anything. But I'm excited for today's conversation. We have a lot, uh, a lot of overlap in 
and commonalities. Uh, so thanks for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. Oh, man. Yeah, of course. My pleasure. Love uh, love getting on the talk. I've been following your channel for a while. Um, so at least at least two years now. I mean, oh, wow. And, yeah. And I don't have a lot of time for long form content because I use my ears all day long. Right. Um, and then with yeah. kids and stuff afterwards. But like yeah. literally anytime I travel, I've got some of your stuff queued up. Uh, I like the Lord of Spirits podcast. Um, that zany podcast is kind of amazing. And, right. uh, you know, a few other things, obviously Jonathan Peugeot is a friend of mine. And, uh, so we check in on each other's content, but yeah, like really, uh, I just, I just recently watched your conversation with Dyer about Verveke. I thought that was so good. Oh, um, thanks. yeah, well, cause I've been going back and forth on, on him for a while, uh, because there's a lot of people in our corner of the internet that are excited about him, but there's always been something a little off and mm -hmm. some of the stuff I had already articulated to myself. Um, and to others, you guys nailed. And then it just it kind of rounded out the position because you seem to know a lot more about stoicism and the actual philosophical categories he's accessing. And so that was really helpful to me. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. I'm humbled that you listen to uh, anything I do over here. So thank you very much. But how did you and Paggio, because you mentioned privately, you, you have a new, you have an event coming up that you're a part of how did you and Paggio link up yeah yeah so the event you're referring to is uh the symbolic world summit and that's happening on leap year 2024 it's a three-day conference in tarpon springs florida uh we can probably i don't know if you can put a link in the description for that uh that would be a great thing so i'm leading the uh the artistic side of um that symbolic world event if you're not familiar with uh jonathan i think most people here probably yeah, are he's but been on the channel before yeah so he's you know he's into typology symbolism yep. and not symbolism in the sense that whether people use it in a modern way or maybe in a protestant way of saying it's like oh representation no it's an actually present a presentation where you're drawing out how things exist fractally and then can then can stack all the way up to where we can begin to see the unseen god and how he's put those attributes in the world before us right. uh, and, the, and all those symbols end in christ himself so right. um yeah, so Jonathan and I, uh, so how we started talking, uh, let me think. Um, okay, so here's what happened. It was <laughs> around 2008, 2009, um, there was a shift happening in me. And it has to do, like people call this the meaning crisis and other things like yep. that. But I was making art and we we're on a record label. And uh, they're trying to get us to write songs that are radio friendly. And okay. I'm, not, I'm just... I understand that it needs to be a business at the same time, but it just wasn't coming naturally to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I understood to kind of like you, there's, there is a way you can kind of hack that system. Um, and it wasn't as bad then. So pop music in, you know, around 2008 still had some variety to it. Uh, it wasn't so repetitive and it wasn't so, um, I would say it wasn't quite as scandalous. Um, you know, people's attention spans have gotten shorter and shorter. And now that people are just resorting to whatever, they can do to get someone's attention immediately. Right. Um, and so you get some kind of scandalous, you know, low unpoetic content. So my wife and I, she was, the uh, I was one of those kids who grew up and I wasn't really into lyrics. And uh, my <laughs> wife was an incredible lyricist. Like I just listened to the music and it, there were so many songs I'd sing them and I didn't even know what the words were. Right, I wasn't even right. paying attention. And, but she kind of unlocked in me this idea of like um, the power of words. And she was a better lyricist than I was when we met. And, um, and so I really have taken over that uh, kind of once that unlocked in my mind, I started um, I started noticing that there were certain things that kind of that stirred me inside in a way that and in a way like it kind of presents itself that there's there's something more to life than just this horizontal flat plane of human interactions and psychology. Right. So I started uh, I think maybe one of the first songs like this that really hit me was a song I wrote called Leviathan. Mm -hmm. And in Leviathan, I, um, I'm personifying this chaos of the ocean in the song, um, but in a practical way, like the, in, the, in the sense that like people forget, you know, uh, maybe Sri Lanka maybe think of this where there was this tidal wave um, mm -hmm. that wiped people out. And it's like, don't people know that like tidal waves happen here every like 50 to 100 years? But it seems to happen slow enough that people forget. And if they don't pass on the stories, they all move back to the beach. <laughs> um, and so it was kind of like this idea. I, I saw the culture taking this turn where it's like, oh, we're forgetting like monsters that were just around the corner and we're bringing them back. Yeah. So I, I personified that story. And it was so weird because um, it's a stupid story about like, you know, almost like a Godzilla. And I got a lump in my throat writing it. And I started to notice that there was this when I got into what was called symbolic content um, there. Uh, there was something where it kind of it lit me up inside. And I didn't think it was, I didn't think I was tapping into something real. I thought I was tapping into something that worked for me. 
And so I started to develop this kind of symbolism. And a lot of it is, is actually traditional biblical, ancient biblical cosmology. I didn't really even think about it that way. I didn't know I wasn't going to any church where people were talking to me about it that way. Or, you know, the, the idea of the heavens and the earth and uh, the land and the sea and these natural opposites that exist. Um, right. So I wasn't thinking about that. And so I started to think about it. And we just started writing from that perspective all the time. Um, even now, like as an as an Orthodox Christian now, I look back and it's still coherent to my views now. Like I was <laughs> without I was not cognitively tapping into it. It was more like kind of intuiting that there was something more going on in the world. Right. Um, and also because I was um, I was a Protestant at the time, I had a lot of scripture in my head and I seemed to have different takeaways than most people did. Uh, of scripture around me and they did not see my takeaways as valid their their takeaways were normally like kind of like that documentary historical um psychological takeaways and i was getting this cosmic image of what was really going on and how coherent it was across the bible so anyway i started writing like that and then by around 2016 um i was looking online to try to find anyone who was to see if what i was tapping into was valid and the right. first person i came across and it was before he was famous was jordan peterson and he had this book called Maps of Meaning. Yep. And it seemed like uh, some of it was really impressive to me. It seemed like he was reaching for something he really couldn't get his head around. But at the same time, compared to what the, the rest of the world understands just floating around out there about symbolism and how it functions in stories in the world, he seemed to be doing better than most people. So shortly after that, um, he had a he did a video with Jonathan Peugeot. And I was like, oh, there's my guy. And <laughs> that's when I started to learn like this was like, what I was tapping into wasn't something I was making up that just worked for me. It was actually, there were, there was some, there was this river of meaning running through the world and there was right. a way to see the world that wasn't this kind of flat materialistic cause and effect that in fact, that the world itself was infused with uh, the image of God in a way, like Paul says, uh, St. Mm -hmm. Paul says that, uh, you know, the invisible attributes of God are, are right. they're self-evident in the world. Right. And so when you get to a verse like, a verse like uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, uh, the convic convictions of things not yet seen. To me, that was also this idea that like there was an aspect of reality and an experience we were given phenomenologically to a degree that could actually be lifted up where you could actually see how those patterns extended beyond what we could touch and see and into right. the invisible. Right. And um, so that was that was the end of that was the beginning of the end of, uh, you know, this kind of Protestant evangelical circles for me, um, because immediately outside of a few people like James Jordan or a guy like Alistair Roberts, well, he's not there. These guys are Anglican. Um, I could, nobody, nobody saw the, this cosmic image in scripture, which I thought was the, the most compelling, you know, story. Um, I just, to, so people know what I'm talking about. I'll give you one example. So there's uh, a guy named Lee Strobel. I got to stop playing my beard is too long. Um, <laughs> so anyway, Lee Strobel, uh, wrote this book called the case for Christ. And it was this kind of materialistic, um, historicity where he's mm -hmm. trying to make, he's doing a good job of what he's doing. He's trying to make a point that is actually like reliable to believe on the historical Christ and he'll, or, or people will take a story. Let's take a story like, uh, okay, with well, the women come to the garden to meet Christ. Mm -hmm. They'll say that this is. They'll, they'll play off a modern uh, feminist trope to say that, hey, this is really showing you that the Bible is true because at this time, nobody would have taken the testimony of women seriously. So having women see Christ first right. wouldn't have worked for the world. Like that was his argument and why it was true. Right. So right. you get into the church fathers and it's like, no, like she mistakes him as a gardener. This is a return to Eden. This is a cosmic image of the reversal of Adam right. coming out of the tomb. And we, and it's like, whoa, which one's better? Like the one that kind of appeals temporarily to as a, as a, yeah, maybe a good argument. Yeah. yeah. Or, or one that like actually starts to expose the reason you exist and what, yeah. how you function inside <laughs> right, and, right. and what this God you're longing for is really like. So, um, that's the example of what it was. So uh, Jonathan and I ended up, I think we connected around 2018 or 2019 and kind of hit it off right away, started working on some things. And um, yeah. And so basically uh, he was one of the big reasons I moved into orthodoxy, I think. Wow. Uh, it was around you know, 2018. It was, we were, I was in search of the early church and uh, I thought it was going to be some sort of like hippie commune, like of people who just kind of spontaneously out of this great affection they had for God organized and formed the church. And then, you know, any quick historical look, you realize that um, it's not that at all. It's it's actually highly organized in a liturgical way right. um, that there is uh, that they saw ritual as a as an important function, not something that's just an emblem 
or, or just a remembrance. And, right. uh, you know, you start to dig into these Roman records of, of searching these uh, house churches they were breaking up, and you see all the same things you see in Orthodoxy. And right. then you eventually come to the point where it's like, okay, like, I have to at least see Orthodox as Christian, you know, where some people try to paint them as not Christian, because there is no, the Christianity we love comes from the Orthodox Church because they canonize scripture. You know, in, in a Protestant world, scripture is so central. It's like the only thing you got most of the time. And uh, it's impossible to see the people and their practices that that helped bring about this canon as not part of what Christianity is or should be. So it really had a, a reversal effect on me. So yeah, that Jonathan and I hooked up. He had me on his channel a couple of times. We've, uh, we collaborated on a few projects. Um, we're collaborating on some stuff coming up. One is um, is a book for his um, Symbolic World Press. I'm, I'm writing one of the fairy tales. And uh, another thing we did is he was a consultant on a film I did called Queen of the Night um, mm. last year. Oh, nice. Well, yeah, like you're talking about the sort of depth, talking about biblical hermeneutics or exegesis and, and the depth of these symbols. You know, again, I think orthodoxy lays itself out nicely in regards to even the Greek word symbolo is two is the throwing together of two realities. It's not mm -hmm. again this empty understanding of a symbol within the post enlightenment Protestant world. You know the Eucharist, for example. Well, we do communion maybe once or every two months, and it's just a symbol. Uh, we don't need right. need wine. It is just for symbol for them. And and but for Orthodox, the symbol isn't empty. Mm -hmm. We would say, you know, during the liturgy, you're talking about the liturgical service, you know, the priest says this bloodless, rational sacrifice. And yet at the same time, we believe ourselves to be actually participating in the body and blood of Christ. This is because the Eucharist is bringing together two realities. Mm -hmm. And that's what a symbol really is. It's a, it's a doorway so that you can see two realities, not something that is just an imble, a, a simple, uh, empty uh, gesture towards meaning of some sort. Yeah, I totally agree. I think the short way of saying that I say to people is that there's, there are representations and then there are presentations. Mm. The symbolism is a presentation of a reality of a reality. You can't necessarily always put your hands on right away or a presentation of how things are connected over different levels of reality. Um, you mean, there's a way you can look at the entire cosmos. So when you look outside in my cosmos, I don't mean like you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson, by the way, our <laughs> names are too similar. Don't Google me because you'll find him. Um, so the uh, not the way Neil deGrasse Tyson thinks of the cosmos as we're some not central point to it. Right. Um, but the idea that we're given this presentation of the world, um, it's staged in a way to have meaning to us where there, there's the heavens above and the earth below. And uh, that actually, if you start to understand those things, like how the heavens function and how the earth functions, you can understand your own spirit or mind, intellect and body at the same time. So these things work fractally, um, you know, all the way up and down. And I think this is a way more, you know, I understand why people are making materialistic ar arguments out there. I wonder, I understand why there's companies like answers and Genesis trying to present some sort of scientific, um, explanation from the Bible. I get why they're trying to do that. It's just not going to hold. It doesn't right. hold. Um, it doesn't hold in times of doubt. You know, um, but when you when you actually start to see this the this deep deep language of scripture, you realize there's no way that just a bunch of random guys fudge the details to put it together in the end. It's right. that it's way too coherent. It's actually right. seeing things you never could have seen without it, and um, and I think that's you know, and, and it actually changes you. It right. actually changes you because you become someone who actually can recognize what beauty is. You don't you stop seeing beauty as something that's just subjective to your idiosyncrasies and taste. You start seeing beauty as something that's um, that's substantial. It's when things come together justly in the right way. Um, and so when opposites are brought together properly instead of forced together or brought together as like some kind of mess or mixture or out of place. Right. So, yeah, I don't. Um, I, I recommend this kind of thought for everyone. I, the, the Orthodox Church is the is really has been the answer to the current crisis uh, of my own life of this flat worldview where it's like, oh, OK, I guess I'm supposed to, you know, I, I, I tease Jordan about this because he talks about lobsters and lobster evolution. I was like, dude, that idea, that argument has a shelf life. It's going to change. Like, it's a great point you're making. It's not the point It's the, arg the argument's going to have a shelf life. It's right. got the, all this information is going to change this thing that we're being asked to bow down to and believe in as if it's the real description of reality. Everybody who's involved in it 
knows it's all going to change and it's always changing. Right. So uh, I can put my faith in that or I can put my faith <laughs> in something, in another way of looking at scripture, which is about the unchangeable and the actual uh, reason and uh, presentation of the heavens uh, and the pattern of the heavens in reality itself. And, and that's why I think that in regards to this meaning crisis, orthodoxy is the solution. It is the answer. You know, we're talking about, you mentioned Verveke, the stream I did with Jordan, and his whole thing is like and solving the, the meaning crisis by creating a mythology around science because mm -hmm. science lacks a mythos. And then we can form a, an ethical system and here, then we can have the AI come into emergence and that's going to be our, our Silicon sages. That's going to be the way in which will be saved and we'll have these wisdom figures to guide us into the future but that's not solving the meaning crisis uh that's not giving you depth and what you're talking about how when you encounter scripture began to look at things differently i always say to people that's your again encountering the logos encountering jesus christ he heals the blind and so right. for me that's what i always try to tell people and this is the hardest thing to give to your friends or your family or the people closest to you when especially when you go on this orthodox journey because a lot of people see it as a little bit uh too much and so but when you go down that journey and you begin to see things you didn't see before like literally like the blind man in scripture christ is healing your eyes so that you have eyes to see and ears to hear you just want to give that back to other people but you can't because it is a sort of personal internal journey within your own heart and mm -hmm. in the, in the search for truth and meaning. And yeah. so it, it's not, it's not a consumeristic item that you can just give to people for, you know, five 99 or, you know, join your Patreon. It, it's, it, you have to hope that people are, or be some type of catalyst for people to go search it on their own. And, and orthodoxy, I think is you get it all. You get it. You get the Christian faith that's unchanging. You get the history. You get the depth of the theology. I mean, that's one of the things I love about orthodoxy is that it's just endless, whether it be mm -hmm. hermeneutics, looking at scripture, going back and, and uh, understanding the history of the saints um, or so on. It's just it, it, that is the solution to the meaning crisis. And now you have a, you have something foundational to stand on, especially as a young man in the 21st century where there's nothing for you to stand on. And even now, you know, you have the rise of the manosphere and the red pill and all this stuff. And young men are finding out they're trying to get married or, or dating. And like, well, I don't have a lot to offer a modern woman because she makes her own money. She has her own stuff. She goes out and does her, you know, has her, what do I do as a man? Right. Not a lot of foundation there. So men need to reorient themselves. I think orthodoxy is that which will do it and then give you purpose and meaning so that you can then go and pursue the goals that God has for you and then hopefully through Providence, the right person will emerge. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's something uh, I think about a lot. Um, so the, uh, the church I go to is called St. Demetrius. And, you know, we just celebrated um, the great Vespers of St. Demetrius on Wednesday. Of Thessaloniki? And, uh, of, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, yeah the, I have, uh, I went yeah. to that, his church. I have his icon over here. That that's was awesome. an incredible experience. That church. I don't know if you ever, if you ever get a chance to go there do it. Oh, I'd love to. Um, so there's something so wonderful about that story. And, you know, when you have a, something like as a Protestant, it just sounded crazy. It's like, why do you have a patron saint for your church? Like, well, why is your church named relevant church or something like that? Like what, <laughs> yeah, what are you yeah. talking? At least we're, we're, we're aiming someone who gave their life, you know, and, and <laughs> as an example to follow and, and, and you're trying to like, I don't know. Anyway, um, I don't want to be mean. Um, <laughs> So anyway, the uh, St. Demetrius story is great for someone like me because um, there's a, there's all these young men showing up at church out of nowhere, like from the Internet. They come in, they'll recognize me from something they've seen. They'll you know, they came in through a channel like yours or Jonathan Peugeot or it's like sometimes even Jordan Peterson doesn't realize he's sending people to church. Um, all he has to do is mention it. And people are like people are so hungry for any practical step. They'll go and look. And yeah, like the same thing is coming in. And uh all these guys are coming in. So orthodoxy is so incredibly helpful because the people are bouncing around in this Gnosticism waiting for a piece of information they're missing. Like right. this is, I used to show up at church waiting for this because I could never order my passions. I'm a very creative person. You're always smart enough to come up with a reason to do this dumb thing you want to do. Yeah. Um, you know, you're always smart enough to trick yourself. And, yeah. uh, True. And so there was no in in like an evangelical or even some reform circles that are like this, um, where you're where you're told that worship is getting yourself into this mode where you have this incredible affection for God. Like that that sounds fine, but that's not 
necessarily what worship is because this is just an internal state, uh, an internal state they're talking about. And so the problem with the idea that you're supposed to, you know, go into these services and and manufacture some kind of uh, affection or some kind of passion, like you're supposed to awaken the passions for this. People don't realize, but they're actually training themselves the opposite way of how right. to order your passions. You're because now these people go to a football game and they're cheering real loud and they're like they're holding themselves in contempt because they're like, oh, I don't cheer this loud in church. You know, uh, that must mean I worship this more. Like they don't understand. You know, I don't I don't need to get into the definition of worship necessarily, but mm -hmm. I couldn't order. I could never order my passions. I kept waiting for like you show up at church and you're waiting for that one thing that's going to be said in a sermon that's going to fix the problem. And that's not just that's that's the modern problem in general of the Gnosticism, because you can go to Instagram and it has nothing to do with Christianity or anything. Right. And it's like, here's how you're going to fix your diet problem. Here's the piece of information you're missing. Here's this you know, this other piece of information you need. Here's the thing you need to know about personality types. It's right. like it's all about it's just all about information. And, and it's funny because even in these Christian circles, you will criticize Gnosticism and then at the same time make Gnostic arguments and, and act like a Gnostic all the time. So uh, the the ordering of the passions is uh, is very important. So as I started to like, you know, I was around I was around a lot of I don't want to drop people's names um, because it'll put them in a little bit of bad light, but around a lot of very famous people in the Protestant world and they had an advantage that really wasn't an advantage to them um, for keeping their own passions in check. And that was mm. reputation. It's mm. it's hard for people to recognize this if they haven't really properly ordered themselves or begun to order themselves. Cause mm -hmm. like, I, I can't say I'm properly ordered, um, but <laughs> or, ordering your passions, um, you have to go out and so they, they don't understand. Like if, if you're having a problem, let's say you're having a problem with alcohol or pornography or something. And I offer you a million dollars. I said every month you don't, go near this stuff. I give you a million dollars. You're going to find that you, Hey, you maybe had more agency over that thing than you thought. Right. The problem is that's, that's just moving the furniture around. You're swapping one passion for another, right? You're swapping your passion for money. And so a lot of the leadership, right? Like they might not actually, what they're preaching isn't working in them, but they have something else at stake that allows them to hold their ground, right? At least publicly hold their mm -hmm. ground to kind of stay, on the course. And so, um, moving into orthodoxy and you realize that there's all this stuff in scripture for one, if you just want to talk scripture, you're papering over because you're not even engaged in the idea of fasting, like right. with any kind of biblical understanding or, or understanding that the church has historically had of it. Right. You're not engaging uh, prayer the same way you're, right. you're, um, and so when you start to look at those things, you start to realize that you're like, Oh my gosh, like this was always meant to be a marriage between faith and action, right? The right. two things you can't separate the two things from each other, or you don't have right. fruit. Like you can't make a baby without a man and a woman, right? You know, say the man is faith and the woman is action. Like you can't, it doesn't happen. And this is, you know, James is very clear about this and all this stuff I used to paper over forever. And then, you know, after like a, a confusing year of just finding the Orthodox Church beautiful, but not really be able to get my head around it, all of a sudden it starts to click inside. You realize that um, you, you start to realize that oh, all of this stuff is in there. So I, I have dominion over my body, right? right? So that my body doesn't flip the roles where the mob takes over and starts to run the government. Um, so that <laughs> this has been so helpful for me because uh, that's really what's going on. Like you can see it in you can see it in in the I read the Life of Moses by Saint Gregory of Nyssa. Oh yeah, um, incredible right book. Yep, but. He started, you know, breaks down the life of Moses for people who haven't read it in a way that you can understand how to how to live for Christ. Right. right? Um, and so when you start to see things in the story that are confusing at the first time you read the story, you're kind of like, why do these people want to go back to Egypt already? It's like they just left. Don't they know better? Like they, that and you forget, like you wake up in your body every morning. It's going to be hungry like your body, like which the people represent. It's going to ask for the same things it asked for. Even though you maybe had a bad experience, you feel a little regret about something you did wrong, it's going to come back, mm -hmm. right? That you, it may have left the house for now, but it's going to come back unless the strong man enters and uh, can keep it out. So uh, orthodoxy presented that to me. And two, especially someone in art, in because art, you're always trying to deal with beauty. And it made sense historically what happened with art in Christianity where, um, you know, in the West, at least where the Catholic church was building these incredible, beautiful cathedrals. And, um, but this tradition 
this tradition started to get stranger over time. You know, we look at the Sistine Chapel and we say, well, that thing's beautiful. And also it's like, well, there's God drawn like Zeus and yep. naked angels, like little yep. boys everywhere. Naked it's angel like, babies. Yeah. Okay. We got a problem. All right. This is, <laughs> we got a problem here because why, how did that we get from iconography? Right. Right. Um, how do we get it's from so modest, right? Yes. That's one of the things that orthodoxy is explicit. What reason why we don't do statuary is we don't want to inflame passions through our symbolism. And so mm -hmm. right there, you see that. Well, it seems like you guys are inflaming a few passions over here. Right. And the reason that occurred, I think the reason that broke down is because they started to move away from the asceticism of it. Right. Yeah. So so the the thing you you have to understand, like where orthodoxy gets it so right, it's like you can actually handle a ton of beauty. If you have discipline over yourself, you have you increase the capacity to see beauty, experience beauty in the world, even in places that other people would overlook it. You can start to everything starts to glow and become beautiful because you start to see God in it Amen. and you start to see it for its real purpose. Yep. But you can't do that unless you start um, unless you start to enact in your life the actual practices and Christian disciplines that are that are done so that those things won't misdirect be misdirected right away they won't inflame your passions but they'll they'll elevate both the your body and your spirit mm -hmm. um when you participate in them so you can really see that and you can see why you can see why some protestants started to move away from that because it's it's weird right if you're in the 17th century and you're you see the sistine chapel and you're a protestant this is gross to you yeah um even though it's incredibly well made um and you can see why they kind of got to four walls in the gospels because well they weren't going to pick up the asceticism so they couldn't have the beauty if they wanted to to not fall off the deep end in a way. And right. so in a way, it's like it's a bad solution, but it's a real problem that they yeah. saw. And uh, falling back in, falling backwards into the ancient church and this more ancient way of thinking was sort of like, oh, my gosh, I can be a whole human. Um, I could be a whole person like I can um, and I can aim higher to the. Uh, well, I don't want to make my next point uh, in case you have something you want to say. For well, I was going to ask you yeah. what, what your spiritual background was growing up. Um, yeah. because I'm, I'm curious talking about Protestantism and you're the creative type. I kind of, even though I'm not explicitly a musician or an artist in the traditional sense, I think I sort of a, uh, creative type, especially in regards to ideas. And so I, I got drawn into the occultism, the esotericism, drug mm -hmm. use, psychedelics, all that type of stuff. Yeah. I'm curious, did, did that ever play a role in your journey that eventually led to orthodoxy or what was your spiritual journey from growing up to now? Okay. So, um, I was a little kid and I don't think we went to any churches. My parents both grew up Catholic. And I remember one day my mom, I think she was having a tough time with my dad. I'm not sure. Um, but she wanted to walk down to the Catholic church on the end of the street and pray. And so we all walked down. I was like, I was small. I was probably about three. And they had a very vivid car wood carved cross of, of the crucifixion. And I remember going like really as close as they would let me walk up towards it because there was no one in the church. My mom just wanted to pray there, but I kind of wandered up to the front of the altar and I could see like there was like even like they went through the, the I'm not saying this is good, but they went through the detailed point of like, you know, there were swollen marks where the nails had gone in and there was representation of the blood. And I was like, what the heck is this building? Like, why is this the thing they have on the wall that they all look at? Like, it was just it was so fascinating to me. Um, and so I think my parents who were having trouble decided that they were going to go back to Catholic church and, but I don't know if they wanted to go. I think they were just like, we're starting to spin off the rails here maybe. And you know, our marriage isn't going great. So maybe this could help kind of thing. Right. Uh, so I was sent to Catholic school and Catholic church, but eventually it was the kind of thing where like, I don't even think they wanted to go. They would like drop me and my brother off at it and we wouldn't <laughs> actually go to church. We would sneak out the other door and go get donuts. Um, <laughs> and so it was around the time I was going to be confirmed into the church that uh, I started to think about it for myself because there, I was never I never fell into atheism or anything like that. Um, but at the same time, I was I always saw God as like a genie who was going to help me get what I needed. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> right. That kind of that kind of version of it. And I had an uncle who had a Pentecostal church he had started. And they invited my brother and my cousin and I who hung out. We were always in bands. I was always I was recording artists from my teenage years. Um, and uh, he's like, hey, listen, we got a problem with my youth group. It's all girls and we don't have any guys. Can you guys come? And I'm not going because I'm thinking they need guys. I'm thinking there's a lot of girls there. So I'll go. Yeah. Uh, and so we go and it's a Pentecostal church. And it's so weird. It's just super weird. But it's I always tell people like this. Um, it's amazing like what 
if Christ is in it, even a little, like what can happen? Right. Uh, because it start, I started, I think, a journey there um, that brought me to where I am now, but it started there, you know. Um, and so I would have weird thoughts growing up, too. I'd have – so when I started playing music, it, this doesn't make any sense why I had these thoughts, except for the fact that there's, like, some kind of angel preaching in your ear or something like that. But I was like – I remember sitting there one day, and I'm, I'm like, I'm going to try to write a song. And I completely start writing a Christian song, like, about, like – the most high thing like and i'm like what the heck is this this isn't going to get me girls um i was like this is so <laughs> stupid what am i doing and i kept writing christian songs like um i didn't even have a label for that like i wasn't listening to christian music at the time um uh or striper or petra or whatever those bands were and uh i couldn't i and i kept thinking i had this thought in my mind it was like it would just come back into my mind almost like an almost like i guess it's a, so then it was almost like a demon to me but it was like hey you should you should you know, write music that glorifies God. I'm like, where's that thought coming from? I'm like, this is so strange. I don't know what's going on here. And um, so I didn't know what to do with it. So there, I always felt there was something stirring in me. Um, and so I never kind of went off the deep end in that capacity. In high school, I loved the identity of being kind of a rocker who was straight edge. Oh, okay. Um, you yeah. know, so my my, my dad um, has recovered from alcoholism for a long time, uh, mm. but he was, a, he was an alcoholic. He was a famous uh, person um, in our part of the, country um it, we, i grew up in new england and he had a radio show that was really popular and so everybody knew my dad my dad was on billboards everywhere uh, uh -huh. if i said my last name or if i got pulled over by a cop they knew who i was and they let me go whatever um that kind of situation so um so yeah anyway um that's what my my house was like and so i started noticing early on there was something wrong because it was like a pentecostal circle and this i could describe i'll give you a little um hindsight um before I like go through the experience is that I, all the schismatic churches in the world are all about the thing that makes them different. Like, that's it. Like if you're Pentecostal, right. like the songs are going to be about all the things that Pentecostals do. Like it, right. the sermons are always going to push scripture back towards, Hey, this is about praying in tongues or speaking in tongues. This is about healing. This is about, you know, um, their versions of that thing. You know, you go to reform church, everything's about God's sovereignty penal substitution. I was part of a songwriting retreat um, and it was a reformed group. And I realized right away um, that they didn't, every song that they didn't like the lyrics to, I was just, I would just tell people like, listen, if you just change it to substitutionary atonement, they're going to like your song. Right. You know, that's, <laughs> that's the secret. And everywhere you went, you realized it was about like, everything was about the thing that made them different, not necessarily what we have in common. Right. And there's this massive scandal in this. There's this uh, like where you're literally competing against people next door who are supposed to believe in the same thing. You're, you know, there's this kind of fear that people are going to show not show up at your church and go to other churches. And um, so there was this scandal that was always very troubling to me. Um, and so that by the time, so by the time I think uh, it was maybe 2017, I was like, I got to get out of here. I got to get like, cause I've, I've tried everything in those circles and you'd learn something new. So if you went from, let's say just straight old evangelical born again, Christian world into more of reformed Calvinistic world, you gained something a little bit, you gained a new way to think, you gained a different perspective at the same time. You were very, it was very obvious that it was super empty. Like right. it was thin. It was thin. I wouldn't say completely empty. There are things in there that are, that were helpful to me and are still helpful to me, but it was too thin. It wasn't mm -hmm. enough. It wasn't, it wasn't a whole life. Um, and so it wasn't certainly wasn't a way to live either. It was just a way to think. And so all these different circles were, hey, we do music and then we preach at you for 45 minutes and you won't remember a thing we said a year later. Um, that was kind of um, what that circle was. So uh, I was always kind of an outcast, even though people people seem to promote me ahead of my character because of talent. You know, it's like, hey, if you can make music, we are all about music, you do video, you do art. We're all about those things. You're like, we can overlook the fact that you're a total madman. Um, <laughs> you know, so that was always, I was always a madman to them. Like, and I probably was, I was probably a little bit crazy. And uh, um, yeah, so anyway, that's kind of, that's kind of the journey I took. Also, um, like orthodoxy, I, I think it was really an answer to um, some of the conflict I, I had in the world about uh the politicism of the church, like the way things were so politicized, because I never really identified totally with a party and the way I saw it. Like, so for example, I'm kind of, I hate to say this because it's going to sound wrong to people, but I have a liberal temperament. 
meaning that I'm interested in something new. I'm interested in in seeing what kind of good potential there is on the outside um, of the things you're already doing. Uh, at the same time, you know, as you get older, you start to realize like you can't always reinvent the wheel. You can't, um, you know, that if things can only be a little bit new at a time or they fall apart. And so I was never really um, like politically liberal, but as a person, in no matter whatever conservative circle as I was in, I was always the liberal guy. Like who was like looking at the thing no one else was looking at. Um, <laughs> so I couldn't escape the politicism though. I remember myself, I would just get on Facebook and it was like when the thing first came out and I like, I didn't know what to do with myself. It's like just someone saying something I didn't like. It's like, Oh, this is my job to talk to them about this right now. It's like, no, it's not. <laughs> it takes it took me years to learn that. And yeah. so I'd just be sitting there just trying to dunk on people on social media. And I was like, Oh, I don't think this is the way, um, you know, how do we, how do I solve this problem? And I remember it was the first divine liturgy I went to it was at St. Michael's church in, um, in Louisville, Kentucky. And they, uh, uh there you been there or, you know, I've, you I'm know? well aware of it. I have not been there. Some guys at that church been asking me to go. Oh yeah, for sure. Beautiful. Uh, father Lucas is my, uh, spiritual father. Um, and, uh, that church has beautiful choir like one of the best chanters I've ever heard, a guy named Stephen Jacobs. He's just so powerful. Um, it's an enormous church, like 500 families. And I just went to the service and I stood in the back and I was so, it wasn't, I wouldn't say irrationally, but irrationally moved. Like it was like, I knew there was something true going on, but I couldn't, I didn't know the theology of it yet or anything like that. And I, I heard the music and it's funny what sticks with me over time, but they, they, there's this moment in the service where they like, they pray for those who love us and those who hate us. Mm. Right. And I was like, I hate people. Like, I hate people that don't agree with me. Why? Like, why? Like, I don't, I don't really treat them like I hate them. Like I'd still do good things for them. But at the same time, there's a part of you that's like, you don't realize if you're honest with yourself, um, what's really in your heart. And when I heard that, I was like, um, I kept thinking of father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And it started like it, it, it started this change in me um, where there was a, there was more generosity towards other people. And I started to see that there was this broken fellowship in the world um, that we all long to have this closeness and this agreement and this unity. Um, but there was no path for that through politics and through modern thinking or even psychology um, that that answer was going to lie at the highest point within God himself, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you know, and that Christianity ultimately, you know, speaks of the day where this ends. Um, and so that was a really moving experience. Like I looked, you know, I, I cried like Jordan Peterson talking about how much people love him uh, in the background <laughs> of the church. No, I just, I, you know, I like to tease him because, uh, you know, when he, when he talks about people being moved by what he's doing, he cries, yeah. um, which is kind of funny, but also it's sweet. Yeah. It's sweet. Um, well, Malchizedek just threw in a super chat asking you, he he uh, went through and looked at some of your music. Said, I'm pleasantly surprised how orthodox your music is before you were orthodox. What do you attribute that instinct? Yeah, I think that it's, um, I'd have to say, everybody has different things they're going to be good at or bad at, right? You know, for example, I'm six, almost six one, I'm not going to play center in the NBA right? Not going to do it. Like could be a point guard, maybe not anymore, but yeah. you know what I'm saying? So there's certain things you're born with innately. And, um, there's some people have a way of seeing and they become artists sometimes. And it's, um, you have ability to get above the weeds and kind of see things for what's really happening. And so when, you know, I, like I said earlier, I'll just use the same verse, not to add confusion, but like when Paul's talking about the, the invisible attributes of God are in the world itself and that Christ actually presents nature's beauty as the superior beauty when he's talking about oh you know look at the lilies of the field solomon wasn't even clothed like this you know uh look at the birds of the air he starts to point to these things and it's true that as an artist you never you can never even come close to the kind of beauty that exists like i live near the beach here in florida and every morning when i go out to get coffee there's people lined up watching the sunrise on the east coast here and it's like why are they doing that it's like, well, you can't beat that. Like, it never gets old for me. Trees don't get old. Like, none of this gets old. It gets better all the time. The more I learn, the more I, I learn about God. Right. The, like, I don't look out of the window the same way. I get out of bed, like, on fire to go and do things because the, it's um, there's so much beauty to encounter. And I think that 
I think I was starting to get into that aspect of it. I also, I think I had a lot of, um, I read Genesis over and over and over again all the time. And it, I think it just started to pattern the way I was thinking. And all of the Orthodox doctrines exist in Genesis. Like if you mm -hmm. want to get into dogma, dog, they all appear like and some of it's too, maybe too distant. There's not enough examples yet to really see it. But, um, you know, that, that sort of, uh, I think patterned my thinking, the fact that I was so obsessed with Genesis and was trying to get to the bottom of it. And I was thinking about it symbolically. And I've been really happy to find that a lot of these intuitions, and some of them were wrong on my part, but I was happy to find as I start to like get into like the, you know, the patristic tradition and right. especially the more esoteric fathers. I'm like, this is the same thing. We were seeing this, we're seeing the same world out the window. Right. Um, you know, and so. Uh, I think that helps. I think it also helped that I wasn't really, I'm not a stuff guy. I don't like money. I don't like spending money. I have money to spend. I don't spend it really. I don't, um, I don't, um, I have never really been, um, I, I've never really been like a person who struggled with addiction. Like we were talking about substance abuse or something yeah. like that. Like, um, you know, so those things, uh, those things weren't clouding me. There are other things were clouding me. Um, but I think that helped. I don't know. This is a guess. I'll ask yeah. God one day. Uh, but I, I agree with that. I, I think that's weird. When I go back and look at her stuff, I'm like, oh my gosh, that is so like that is I'm just writing a story that came to me. And one of the things you do when you write a story is you'll push if you if you're not trying to be too intentional with it, like in other words, you're just trying to look for what feels right. There's a way in which you push details around and eventually, like you might get the same thing when you're like you're putting together a presentation. All of a sudden you find something and you move it here and it locks. Yep. And it's so solid. You're like, that's that's there. This is right. where it belongs. And so that's what happens. You write a story. I'll get this big idea. And so we can talk about one of my stories here coming up because I need your help. Um, and uh, but there's details you're pushing around and, and eventually like something will come to you and it just locks. And I don't even think about why it's true. Like sometimes I, like I'll tell people it's like I literally they, they, people want to know what the songs are about. And I'm like, that's none of my business. Like in a way, it's like none of my business in the sense that I can critically break them down. But part of the joy of making art in the sense that like Solomon talks about, like, you know, putting this dark riddle forward to people is that it's not, um, you know, just explaining things to people isn't always the most helpful way. You can dangle something out in, into the world where it's implicit. And then when people make the connection themselves, now they own it as opposed to someone told me this answer. Right. But if you can help people to figure figure what's true out for themselves and and find like and and own this for themselves and their own experience, I think art can do that if it just if it buries a treasure in the sand just deep enough where you don't can't find it right away. But if you're willing to do a little work, there's a treasure there. Um so I think that's also I think that's also another way to do it. So I try to leave um as much as I, I like to think theologically and whatnot when I'm coming up with art, and I think this is why my art or art seems to resonate across the aisle, um, is that I'm not I'm not imposing, I'm I'm trying not to impose propagandistically something on it. Uh, I think about the fact that art has to have it has to remain wild. It's just like a like the best example ever. This is like okay, so I'm an uh, I conserve animals that are in the wild that are wounded. So uh -huh. like a baby fox shows up on my doorstep wounded, I if I want to do my job right, I have to raise it to health and then release it. So it, I didn't, I didn't put the stink of man on it. Like it's, it still can go out and live a wild life in the, in the right. world. And so there's so much overlooked aspects of Christianity that are like that in, in parable and um, you know, in some, in some of these riddles the scripture puts forward is that it's actually, it's not just giving you, it's just not coming up with a list of doctrine for you. It's coming up with stories that you can inhabit, that you go and inhabit those stories, and then you see it for yourself, and now you own it. It's not just something that someone handed to you. So, yeah, that, that that's a great response. I love that. Um, I was also, based on my listening to your conversation with Jonathan Paggio, I'm curious if you wouldn't mind sharing how you actually met your wife and how that led into uh, your your band, your music career. Um, yeah, because okay. I thought that was I thought that was hilarious how that. How that well, this is hard. This is this is a good topic. Sometimes my story is not always helpful for people because um, I mean, it, I meet a lot of guys that they need to do some work. Um, they need to do some work to learn how to present themselves as attractive, right, to right. someone else. Um, and my story is going to sound a little bit like God just dropped someone in there. <laughs> OK, so <laughs> that can happen. 
All right. But you 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 dealt and developed the skills to even be in the position to meet your wife. That's and true. I think that's and that's part of what even uh, talking with some of the young young men uh, that follow my channels, mostly young men, um, that you you do have to sort of make yourself as a man. You have to gain some type of skill mm -hmm. set. You have to uh, you know have have a directionality and some momentum to your life. And yeah. I think, unfortunately, just given the society and I've done so many one on ones with young men that they just have no masculine role models that they're, yeah. you know, there was no father figure. Uh, their parents were divorced. And and so now they're in their early 20s and, and they're like, well, I'm orthodox. I thought I was promised, you know, the virgin trad girl that's going to be my wife and give me babies. It's it's not that easy, yeah. man. No, I mean, yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I see. I, I have this conversation all the time, David, like with people all the time. And um, so uh, have you, did you see the as we get into this, like I'm, I'm taking a long time to get there. Uh, did right. you see the Arnold Schwarzenegger documentary on Netflix it was about his life? I have not. I heard it's actually pretty good. I, I got I got turned off on Arnold when the uh, when the coup happened and, and he told everybody to F their freedoms. Um, oh, ha I hadn't invested much time, but I actually have heard both his autobiography and the documentary were pretty good. Yeah. So what was neat about the documentary, I think there's some there's some helpfulness to someone if they if they get this idea, like Arnold's telling to people like at his worst, he was just trying to figure out how to be useful. Like if I can be useful, then people need me. Right. Right. Um, so he um, I think he starts to get in the right direction. So the the reality is, is that um, so in Protestantism, I was aiming too low. Like I didn't, I was just trying to be like my pastor or someone else around me, but nobody was really trying to be holy. They were trying to be smart, you know, uh, yeah, and they're yeah. trying not to mess up. Yeah. Right. Cause, cause and it's very different. It's such a rational belief system. There's not a whole lot of mysticism. Yeah. I think it leads to sort of, well, I just need to know more, no more, no more. That sort of underlying Gnostic presupposition you mentioned earlier in the conversation. Yeah. And so, um, like, oh, for example, like my own priest, uh, father Joseph, um, Saman, he would hate that I mentioned this, but <laughs> he really strikes me as like someone like I, I seldom met in my lifetime because it's, he's actually trying to be holy. Like he does <laughs> things that are almost impossible to do all the time, right? He's got story after story and you can be with him and watch the stories happen. It's just incredible. And so it's a different expectation of what a human can be. Cause I think if you grow up Orthodox and you're in a family that really takes it seriously, it's not just kind of going through it ethnically or culturally or, right. or socially, um, you're not going to be asking those questions that Protestant kids ask or like, where are all the miracles that we see in the Bible? Cause you see something closer to that. You see something closer to what's happening in acts in my church right, and right. other Orthodox church. It's like, Oh, I don't, I don't think about asking that questions. You again, we, we venerate these stories of the saints and the, and the saints themselves and that their lives are like this. They're doing incredible, impossible things. So there's, there's a, a, there's a quest in orthodoxy to be impossible. Like if like to become a saint is to be something you could not become without God. Right. It's impossible for you. You there's right. it's a it's a complete dilemma. There's no chance of you ever getting there. Right. Um but a saint is not just someone who's useful. It's not just someone who's helpful. It's someone who's a gift. You know. So the for guys it's always like be a gift and and sharpen yourself to a point in some way that you're useful as a gift to a community, meaning that you have to develop a skill that where you know, so the developing a skill is like sharpening something to a point. And the sharper that point is, the farther out into the world you can go with that. And, yep. you know, because really, if you think about, you know, let's think about famous people. Like, they're always known for one thing, and they're really bad at everything else. Like, LeBron James is a very sharp point when it comes to basketball. It's just a blunt, dull object when it comes to politics. Um, <laughs> well, he's been working on the first page of the Malcolm X <laughs> biography yeah, right. for like three years. He's always pictured <laughs> with the same book on the same page. He's uh, it's just it's it, it's taking a while to get through there. Um, it's pretty thick. Um, skull. So the uh, anyway, but there, you know, so just like this. So you're you're right. Okay, so um, when other people were doing other things in high school or partying, I was playing guitar. I was working on music. I was trying to sing. Uh, I was creating films all the time on the weekends. Like I was always filmmaking. And, um, and so I was trying to, I was trying to, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be popular in my high school. I was trying to, um, I was trying to figure out how to do something I loved with my life. And mm. that's something that I had, a, that I was compelled to do even more than like, just liked, like music became a thing where it's like, I can't stop it. Like if I, even if I didn't like it, I would just keep going. Cause I'm compelled now. It's like, it's, it's part of, I can see, I can see God when I'm doing my job. Well, I feel 
intimacy with God. Like when I serve in my church in any way, um, I feel intimacy with God because you can you can sense that it's not just this in a Protestant way, just trying to look back and forth at God, like this one on one relationship, which is fine. Like that's an aspect of Christianity. But there's this aspect where, you know, God takes you up and shows you his kingdom and gives you a job to do. And now you're you're moving forward together into the world. And so uh, music has kind of turned into that for me before I was really even close to God. I could sense that I knew that the like, music was something he put here for us, that we could it was a presentation of the unseen mm -hmm. um, and it added depth and meaning to the world. Um, and so I was, it was important that I use that responsibly. So anyway, I did develop that. I worked, I worked my butt off as a kid. Um, and okay. So moving on in life, I was having trouble getting myself together as a man. Uh, I was 22, 23, uh, maybe 23. Um, and like, I grew up in the part of the country in new England where, um, Southern new England, like between Boston and New York are some of the harshest most straightforward people in the world and it's <laughs> it's fine like i was totally fine with that but i was a dreamer and so we would used to refer to it this way is that like telling anybody something you dreamed about doing or something kind of grand it was like a turtle just putting its head out of its shell to get hit with a hammer because it right. was instantly everybody tried to put you in your place and you're like fine uh build some resilience i actually kind of liked that environment i think it was good for me um but anyway the um you know dreaming was it was not the culture for that kind of thing so I was having trouble putting together because everybody was saying that like, even my parents who were entertainers uh, were kind of like, you need to get a real job. Like this music thing's not going to work out. Um, and even though it was my job, like literally paid for it since I was 13. Um, I was kind of like, dang, they're right. Everybody's got, everybody's saying the same thing. They got to be right. So I'm trying to find a day job, right. That I could be entertained with, but it was just like my high school experience of just, utter boredom and torture and feeling like I was in a cage and a prison and everything was moving too slow and nothing was challenging enough. It wasn't that the job was too hard. It, it was generally too hard for me because I needed some kind of engagement. So I couldn't figure out what to do. So I was so poor. I was living in Providence, Rhode Island in like the poorest part of town. Um, and people, it was so poor that people, I had a car and the first night I moved into my apartment, they stole everything from it except for the the body of the car virtually like it was gone wow. I had no wheels nothing um and uh so that's so i know i had no car and this is how i met my wife in a way um so i would bum rides off friends or whatever people in my neighborhood that i knew or um my roommates and eventually one night my roommates are going out and they're like hey i'm like where are you guys going they're like oh we're going they, they'd say the name of the town we're going here i'm like oh my gosh this is on the way i need to go you guys can you drop me off you know at my friends and they're like, dude, we're sick of driving you around. You ever give us gas money? No, I was a total schlub. I was a mooch. And uh, they're like, you never give us gas money. They're like, oh, but we're going to audition for this musical. And uh, as your payment tonight, just for our you know, amusement, you're going to have to audition too. And I was kind of like, oh, gee, really? I'm going to have to audition for like, I think I'll stay home. And they're like, you don't understand. It's this nationwide search. They've already cast people from California. And now they're on the East Coast casting. They're just missing the leading man. And we're going to go audition. And I'm thinking in my head, these guys are never going to get the leading man role. <laughs> of course, I never thought I was going to. Like, I just right. I hadn't done musicals since high school. And I, they weren't really, musical theater wasn't really my thing. Um, so anyway, we go to the audition. And it's a weird audition because it's in this old church. And all the people auditioning are sitting in the room together. Which is, as you, if you, I was serious about the role, would have been a very uncomfortable moment. Because there were some really good singers and stuff like that. But you, it was just so funny watching it because everybody was scared so scared you could see it in their body language you could see it in their neck there was all this tension and their sweat on their brow and their upper lip <laughs> oh, yeah, and right. everybody even my friends they get up there and my his just voice cracks and he just says terrible and i'm like oh he's so much better than that that's too bad and so i get up no pressure don't want to part don't know anything about the musical and i just try to crack everybody up like i just try to i goof around and i sing and uh i'm trying to be funny be, to make my friends laugh i'm trying to do things that would have been uh you know, a little outrageous for someone to go up and do. And anyway, audition, they drop me off at home. I get a call the next day and they're like, Hey, uh, Neil, I'm like, yeah, they're like, congratulations. you got the part. And I'm like, what part, what are we talking about here? It's like the musical you auditioned for. It's called rage of the heart. And you're actually, we, we, you know, we're casting you as the leading man. It's the story of Peter Abelard and Eloise. Do you, oh, okay. Okay. And so I was cast as a young man as Abelard. They're going to put like gray hair on me. Um, and I was like, no, you don't understand. I don't want to do the musical. 
and they're like no they're like like why do you not want to do the musical it's going to go to london it's going to go here we've casted from all over the country this is a great opportunity for you i was like yeah i'm just not interested <laughs> and uh um so anyway i get off the phone like i thought that was the end of it and the writer calls me back and the writer calls me back he's like listen honestly you're not you're not all that but when i saw you i knew that you were perfect for the leading lady we cast and she's she auditioned out in los angeles and um he started telling me about her now this is like kind of the internet's not really a thing in my neighborhood um so i can't look look her up online or anything um <laughs> But there was something like he was so adamant about this. And this was a guy he was like he worked at the Vatican for a long time. He was an um, ex-Catholic priest and he was he wrote beautiful music and his writing was incredible. The stuff they gave me to sing that night was great. And uh, he was just really adamant that I was going to marry this girl. And I was like, OK, that's baloney. But I mean, she's at least worth meeting. I'm like, I can always drop the musical later. Right. So I liked uh, meet girls. So, uh, you know, I met that's where I met my wife, Kate. She was that girl. <laughs> so he was right. Um, and so that's why I'm reluctant to tell that story. Cause it's like really sweet. Like if a bunch of like, you know, people are sitting around like girls will get teary eyed. You tell them this kind of story. And, uh, but it's also not helpful. I, I don't know. Yeah. It is, maybe it is. Um, it's not, it's not entirely helpful because like the reality is you're probably going to have to go out and do some work, you know, <laughs> like it's not just going to be dropped in your lap. Um, it, but it's part of our story and I don't, and I don't despise it for that reason. I just, I'm reluctant to tell personal experiences like that, where it, it just felt like really God just put his hand in the situation and intervened. Um, because Kate's been like, what, she's like me with a different font, you know, in a, in a different font is like the way I say it. Like we have so much in common, which is, which is so helpful. And like in it. And even too, when I moved into orthodoxy, like her and the kids, like, you know, this can be a problem. They were yeah. like a lot of people. They were like married couples find it because usually the men get interested, and then the yeah. women are like, "It's like a cult. What are you talking about? Like it's way too much." And so it turned out that Kate, who had no background in this things at all, was um, she was painting icons in high school and stuff in art class. Like didn't know what they were, and so when she went to the church, she's like, "Oh, I found my home." And so <laughs> yeah, it was pretty wild. Uh, so here we are, and uh, you know that's it. I, I love getting to talk about these things. I don't get to talk about these things much because I'm never on like. Uh, any kind of orthodox or christian podcast it's always uh you know musicians who want to talk about my guitars or something right so uh it's fun to get to tell this that's why it's fun to talk to jonathan too um because i don't hide these things like our, our music like people are like oh you guys are christian band it's like am i like did jesus die on the cross for my band i don't know if that's the right label right like i mean there are some definitely some it's definitely christian people with the christian worldview but it's not the christianity with like i don't like to answer that question too because it's not the um when people out there in the world just hear the word Christian, they're thinking of like this tourist trap televised version of Christianity where it's not like, it's like you're going to Greece to see the Acropolis and you, and, and these people on TV get stuck in like this tourist trap on the outside where they have a plastic version of the Acropolis and came home, you know, with like a mug. Um, Cause some of Christianity is presented to the world that way. And they're like, it's like, no, if you actually sat down and talked to me about what we're, what we're involved in here, it's very different in, in, uh, well, you even even smarter than you have imagined in your head, like that the way they use that word. So we've never used that label. I would use the label orthodox band because we are doing apocalyptic literature. Our new album is kind of a jaunt into um, kind of a mythological hagiography. Mm -hmm. um, it deals with the uh, it's in, inspired by the story of uh, St. Profarios the Mime. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. If you're familiar with him, if people aren't at home, he's one of these actor saints that's decided to you know mock a baptism um and it actually worked <laughs> so <laughs> he instantly he instantly was transformed by it so um i love the i love the stories of of kind of foolish saints like um the, the holy fool is a, a thing that's really interesting to us and in our storytelling well i'd love to play a little bit of your music and talk about how your orthodoxy infuses your work because mm -hmm. uh, i think your the lyrics on all your songs at least all the ones that i've checked out are really top notch. So I love the 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 narrative throughout your music because every song has it feels like a full narrative to it. Um, but how does as I pull some of the stuff up, how does your faith in Christ and your orthodoxy influence the art that you and Kate make? So this is something we're going to be talking about at um, the Symbolic World Summit, because the number one question I'm asked for people who are involved in those circles are how do you infuse your art with symbolism? without it feeling like propaganda. And I'm like, that's a nice compliment because you said my art doesn't feel like propaganda. 
Um, but at the same time, it's not it's not as intentional as they might be thinking it is in the sense that you you actually um well so for example if if you're there's a lot of people that actually understand this type of type typology and symbols they're beginning to but they're not yet really they haven't really escaped from materialism yet they don't know it they don't know it but they're still absorbing the world through in a materialistic lens and so once you actually start to absorb the world like when a tree is not just this this series of mechanical causalities that evolved when um you know when especially when love isn't some kind of weird evolutionary social construct that or trick that was played on us to get us to procreate when it's actually part of a bigger story yeah. uh when you see marriage as this you know is this way to experience this grander union that's going to happen one day um when you start to actually process the world that way you don't have to try to add it into your art it's it's the way you gain and collect and categorize information in the world and experience it so it just comes out um so you know generally my experience the some of the worst art i've ever made is when i go to and in, i intend to create a thing for a purpose but when i just get inspired um it seems to work uh and it seems to be coherent too and i think that's because of of integrating it in actually integrating this kind of information in your life. It's not just something you keep at church. It's not just something, right. um, you know, you, it's, you, you have a, this nice organized mental picture that you never embody and live in. So by embodying and living it, I think that it's, you don't have to try to incorporate it. Yeah. Okay, so I, what I, are we going to listen to? I, oh, we're on well, my Instagram. The ones that, the two that I like, uh, that really stood out to me in regards to firebird, maybe you can kind of, prelude it by laying out what exactly this project is was fever dream and political were certainly uh, my two favorites yeah oh, uh, oh very if cool if there's anything in particular you'd like to to focus on let me know but i was gonna... no no i mean i always love talking about the new project i mean our most popular song right now in general is from a previous project called enchante um which yes, is I did you know mm -hmm. so um up. enchante uh so this one I think lyrically, so what, you know, what used to happen is we had this problem. I don't, have you ever seen David S. Pumpkins from Saturday Night Live? It's like one of the few good things that's happened in the last 20 years on Saturday Night Live. But uh -huh. he's this Halloween character and nobody can figure out what the heck he is or how to describe him or he can't even describe himself to other people. We've always had that problem. So, you know, so Jonathan Peugeot just says we're like you're, you know, he calls us everybody's favorite apocalyptic band. I'm like, that's probably better than anything. Um, <laughs> so uh, we don't know. We don't know how to describe ourselves, and so our most popular song was never like you could just show someone that song and they'd kind of get their head around us. Yeah, Enchante turned out to be kind of that thing, so it was nice okay. because Kate does most of the vocals in the band. I do some, uh, but this is a song she sings, and it's some people described in the comments as like as like the best roast of materialism and its outcome. Um, but it, it really is just a central point to our story. It takes this this story that this concept record this comes from it's taking place in the 1920s and people as the spirited view of the world is leaving as uh, you know, the veneration of the saints and uh, the worship of embodied worship of God is, is starting to drift away to the corners of the world. People are trying to replace it with some kind of spirit. And this is, it deals with a prohibition as like that problem that arose, like the act, the fact that people had lost this concrete, um, uh, or something that we could say is a more concrete understanding of the spiritual. And it was being replaced by materialistic understanding okay. of the spiritual where alcohol is a spirit. So it, it, the story talks about kind of like this modern view coming in and robbing the world of its meaning. And so where do people turn when they're robbed of their meaning? So the, the hook of the chorus is if we can't raise the dead, we're going to raise hell instead. Um, mm. So that's the, you know, we can listen to a little of that. If you yeah, want. let's, let's check this one out. And yeah. then uh, I definitely want to get to a uh, political and fever dream. I oh for you, sure your 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 guitar is uh, top notch and fever dream man. No, that that's totally my vibe there. Thanks man, I appreciate it. Well, everything you're about to hear except for the female vocals is me. I played everything. Excellent, dude. Not you're a musician. Yeah. All right, let's Thanks, check man. this out.
panes of glass so unafraid, unafraid. And the arch is not to pray, while the gargoyles kept away. Any demon that would scheme to steal my childlike faith. We huddled up, we held on tight, for grounded men were jealous of the angel's flight. Angel's flight. There were butterflies to them, so they brought their boards to pen. The wings and bodies of our gods were studying. We couldn't fight them in the end. Once we saw the heavens through their modern lens. Modern lens. Oh, how can we atone for the secrets we were shown? Like a basilisk, they fixed our spirit's heart at stone. Alas, the muses threw their glasses, stripped away as only madness drowning in the den of our Every myth to crack its lips has nothing more to say. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. If we can't raise the dead, we're gonna raise, we're gonna raise, we're gonna raise. Jared Fetzer, he asked a question regarding that song. He said, I wonder if uh, the book Demons influenced that song at all. 
No, I wouldn't say the book Demons. I didn't read that book. Um, I don't know. If I had to guess what influenced it, um, there's a book I read called, I'm not recommending the book, um, around 2011, 12, called The Dream of Perpetual Motion. And what mm. was so nice about that book is in that book, he, um, what's his name? Palmer. Is uh, is that the guy's name? Okay. So um, he, he starts to talk about his father plays his character for someone who was from the old world, and he was from this new mechanized world. And in the old world, angels and demons sat on the corner and dared you to not believe in them. And he was talking about it wasn't like your modern world where they were replaced by these machines and stuff. And I was like, oh, man, this is this is this is what really like a great analogy for what's happening in the world. Um, right. So, yeah, I think so. But at the same time, there's something even before, let's say, modernity, there's something like that. I think that every adult went through where there's this there's this possibilities that the worlds could be like when you go to when you go to your grandmother's house, that wardrobe might actually lead to Narnia or something like there's this. Right. Imagination. And then eventually, for convenience sake, we reduce things down to these tiny categories and we think we know what things are and we have names for things and we start to lose the wonder and awe. And, you know, Christ says, unless you come to me like with faith like a child. Right. And so uh, there's something about every adult might at some point in their life realize they're kind of grumpy and there's something missing. Like they've lost, <laughs> they've <laughs> yeah. lost, you know, you, you lose this part. You're like, why am I, why am I like the way I am? And you have to recapture. You have to recapture something childlike in the sense that, okay, as a child, you were uninformed with how you were trying to find this agency in the world and this meaning. Um, but just because you were naive doesn't mean you weren't looking for something real. And so the there's a recapturing that I've had in my own life and I've seen other people have it in their own life. Uh, and I, I see this, like, sometimes I'll, I'll meet, like, an old bishop and they're just so old and their eyes are so bright. And there's something, there's an enthusiasm of, like, a kid in the spry uh an eternal spryness to these people and it's like that's it man they, they've they've figured it out in the sense that they haven't figured everything out that there are still categories that are ineffable there's there's so much left to explore in the world there's so much left to know and uh there's all this reason to have this wonder and awe and it's just it's not out there especially like growing up in the 90s and stuff like that the 90s were so flat like we didn't have lord of the rings and harry potter or anything even close to like these kind of proper world buildings we didn't have like the indiana jones of the 80s like raiders of the lost ark is a wonderful analogy for the battle of materialism and, and spiritual narratives mm -hmm. um we didn't have that it was like it was just dying and so um yeah, I've, I experienced that death in my own life and the rebirth of it, like in through music. And then uh, finally, it was like the capstone of that was uh, coming to faith in orthodoxy, uh, mm -hmm. where it made sense of all of these intuitions I had had all along and these things I was I was bemoaning that I had lost. Right. So how does the new project Firebird, how is it? Because it definitely has a different sound. Yeah. yeah. And Enchante has that uh, that uh, 20s vibe to it. Yep. And, so, yep. Yeah, we genre morph. Um, so, uh, you know, that's a great question. So I imagine if you guys want to hear the full audio quality, cause we're, we're, I think this is a stream of a stream. So, um, you know, go to our channel cause uh, audio fidelity is very important yeah. to musicians. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, well, really we're kind of going to be looking at the lyrics and a little bit of the melody like this. So, um, the new project's different. So in that project, because it's a silent film, it wouldn't make sense to have synthesizers and blistering electric guitars or it. Although synthesizers and electric guitars, as well as the orchestral stuff is part of our wheelhouse. Um, so meanwhile, back at the ranch uh, with Firebird. So Firebird takes place in, in a universe that we've already fleshed out in a story called Dead Horse. Now in Dead Horse. OK, so let's you know, let's get into this just for a quick second. Um, in 2018, 2019, I had the sense I had this, you know, as as writing apocalyptic literature, I can explain people like the process that goes through this. But you're if you pay attention to the world in a certain way, you're able to kind of see where the patterns are going. Right. And guess just like um I mean, I, I can give a thousand examples. I won't give any because I think people understand what I'm talking about. Um, anyway, I started to become concerned about this this love of safety and this love of people's own skin and indulgences. And so in Dead Horse, I started to come up with a story that was about a world. I, I saw, for me, I saw the best way as as this kind of globalist totalitarian force to gain control was through pandemics. And so mm -hmm. in 2019, this was a very fortunate discovery of mine uh, because in 2020, um, by March 2020, the soundtrack for the what was going on already existed um, in our stuff. So in, if you go into Dead Horse, there's a couple of songs like It Tore Your Heart Out and But Never a Key and pretty much all of it. But it, it's it's outlining the problem that was coming up. So in the story of Dead Horse, people become separated 
they become lost in their own idiosyncrasies. They they lose real human connection. They're disconnected from meaning. And so the way they try to solve this problem in the world is through an embodied version of AI called the Saints. And the Saints is like an acronym. Like, you know how the people love uh, co-opting and stealing um you know, these deeper categories or even, right, even right. for car names, it's like, you know, you get a car and it's, uh, it's like, a, this car is a Phoenix, Fien Pontiac Phoenix. It's like, is it really like, like you just stole a great story of the Phoenix and you used it to sell a car. Um, so there is this kind of flattening of everything going on in the world. So, uh, in dead horse, um, they try to solve this disconnectedness with people with this, the saints, this, this machinery, you guys just talked about this in your podcast. So funny. Um, is that they, the idea was it was going to be the moral guide. It was right. going to come up. Because I, I think Verveke got his idea for me, sadly. No. Um, <laughs> so, uh, wrong, so it wrong was going to be of the argument, but yeah. It was, <laughs> right. It was going to be our moral guide. It goes terrible. It goes terribly uh, in the story, of course. But it's not really like there's this <laughs> intelligence because if anybody knows anything about AI, it just cheats off the tests. It doesn't actually have an intelligence. At no point did it have a body where it gained the experiences in a body that actually lead to what we call understanding, mm -hmm. um, you know, or knowledge. It doesn't have true knowledge. It just cheats off the test. So it, they, they resort to this model of like basically therapeutic moralism where the, the saints exist, these fake robots and uh, these robots exist to be your moral guides, but really all they're trying to do is make you feel better about everything you're doing and everything that's happening to you all the time. Like that friend that's really not <laughs> helpful. Uh, yeah. And eventually the technology straps up all the way in the story to where they've, they create this technology through AI. They're, they're, your life is so mundane that they're trying to bring life back into it. So it scores your life. So the music makes things that you feel that are very ordinary, like making tea or, you know, uh, making your bed or any kind of normal thing. It, it, it tries to frame it up like there's this really important story going on. So they're trying to find a way to hack in through materialism this meaning of the heavens back in in the right. story. So that story turned out very good. So Firebird is like the other aspect of that. So this this was the idea of like, how does a totalitarian gain control, like totalizing control over the world? How do they get, gain control over your water supply, your very thought life, your activity? Um you know, and it's through separation and attention and tracking like this kind of idea. OK, and how that can go wrong. So this is the other side of the coin of Firebird. So Firebird, those elements exist in this world, but it's it has more to do with like how a totalitarian spirit or something like that can uh, voluntarily get you involved. Like so in other words, they don't have to threaten you with a gun. They don't have to lock you down. They can bait you into doing what they want. You right. cooperate because they do what you want. So in the story of Firebird, and we're just getting into it now, what we released, and I, I, I try not to tell too much of the stories to the general public, but because um, I like I like the way like albums like The Wall and like Radiohead's OK Computer, there's, there's a story behind it, but you don't really know what it is, and it's kind of fun to try to guess at it. So yeah. I don't like to rob people of that too much, but um, this I'm OK to talk about. So there's, in this future, in this part of the Dead Horse story, it's that they realize that, and this is a materialistic solution to the spiritual problem. You kind of see that in the song on Chante too, is that, oh, wait, we can microdose the population at the right time to make them see us as gods. Right. And so the idea is if, you know, this is why you don't want people to have total control over your food and water supply because they can put whatever they want in it. Um, right. And so the, the, I, it dawned on me the idea that the psychedel psychedelics aren't being worked towards the point where they're going to be this artificial bridge into the spiritual. And, you know, like if you have a, like you see someone with like a jealous boyfriend or a jealous girlfriend, they, they, those people aren't happy when people are happy with anyone but them. They want to be right. the totalizing source of joy. And so this is how this could be used against you one day. Like the idea that, okay, when we present ourselves, you know, we give you a mild spiritual experience. So you'll see us as like a small G God. And, um, you know, so the, it's, it's the, it's a false union of, um, the spiritual and the, uh, state in the story of firebird. So we're kind of getting into that story. The story begins like with the song political is like why everything broke down to this point in the first place. And, um, you know, it moves on through a song cry wolf and cry wolf has to do with yep. this like constant, narrative of like the government's like everything you time you turn on the tv the the sky's falling and right um and then at the same time they're mixing in their weird things like you know phony et claymation aliens um, <laughs> yeah and but it's fun like when you so when you see it coming early and you warn people about it they can all kind of be like oh, okay okay we get it um 
So political is, yeah, is if you wanted to play that one. Yeah, yeah, let's play it. Yeah. All right. sick i love that song hey thanks man yeah so that one again filled with uh, a great message and we're seeing the the political entrapment on all sides happening right now you know one of the things that i thought about and we kindly touched upon it just in our private conversation is this whole fiasco that's unfolding in the middle east between israel and palestine and that now the the conservative thought leaders 
are the biggest proponents of cancel culture, you know, and, and this is where we were talking privately as Orthodox Christians. It kind of puts us in a place where you're, you're always sort of uh, the what Father Turbo Qualls would call the royal path. You're, you're on the royal path as an Orthodox Christian where you're not polarized to one end or another. Mm -hmm. Now, typically, we would be associated with more right wing conservative politics and stuff mm -hmm. like that based on the church and our values. But with what's happening in, in Palestine, now we see it, ironic, right? The the far left, the the most radical progressive people are in favor of Palestine, and this is being painted painted as though then they're in favor of Hamas, which then means then they're in favor of radical Islamic terrorism, and and therefore they're all just terrorists. Right. And as an Orthodox Christian, ten percent of Palestine are Orthodox Christians, mm -hmm. uh, and they just blew up the third oldest church in Christendom uh, just well, last week. Mm -hmm. So. You, you as an Orthodox Christian over sitting here, and it's so interesting to see those who are so politically uh, distant from us are now adjacent to us with this with this Palestine thing. And at the same time, the politicians that are deemed like Christian nationalists or right wing Christians, they're now wanting you to not be able to get a job, not be able to go to university, not be able to go to law school if you then support Palestine. Yeah. And it's like, what the heck is happening? And so the everything is political. That yeah. song frames up exactly what we're seeing, where the same people who are against cancel culture and why we need to boycott Bud Light, now they're saying you don't deserve a job or a livelihood if you support Palestine. It's like, what the hell just happened? Yes. Let's just talk about Christian as like a, a overarching category here, not just Orthodox Christians. Um, so uh, Christianity gave up, gave up something really big when it gave up a liturgical life and calendar. Is that, well which you don't realize what I didn't realize before I was Orthodox, like not growing up Orthodox, um, that our calendar is a couple of like secularized versions of holidays and sporting events and political holidays. And so your rhythms of your life are, are really pushed, moved around consumerism and uh, things you acquire even like, Oh, I get my tax return now. Like you have a weird liturgy to your life. And by the Orthodox church was one of the ways I started to gain, um, to gain an escape velocity from this politicized way of thinking where like you really think about, well, if they don't, you know, if you're not voting for my guy, you're voting against him uh, right. or everything came down to like, dude, over and over again, people message me mostly left from the left, but you know, also from the right, they're like, they want to know if I line up with all their stuff. And I said, listen, <laughs> I don't line up with your, I don't know who you are. There's no chance we line up. Like, it's not about that. Like the idea that like this false idea that people can't care about each other, unless they line up politically is so immature. It's so juvenile. I can't even like begin to have a discussion within that world because it's like, that's not, I see you as a person. Like you may have things I think you're deceived about. I have things I'm doing wrong. Um, you know, the problem is, is that somebody knows better. And, you know, as a Christian, you're, when you're talking to someone who's outside of your tradition, you're talking from the point of view that you know better, but we're not talking about something we invented either. So, but the, anyway, the back to the liturgical calendar, like suddenly like, like going through this, like the, the stories and the structure of the Bible is the way it's been built around Easter or Pascha, you know, as we call it, um, through the nativity season and all the different seasons and all the different things you're venerating. Now, instead of paying attention to the state and what's happening politically or what's happening in entertainment or, you know, is it Grammy season? Is it Super Bowl season? Like, it's <laughs> right. like I'm, I'm, I'm focused on like you're you're actually free. And then also, too. For the Orthodox Christians, I think they have an advantage when it comes to looking at events like this in politics because um, we don't have hope that the government is going to redeem us. The, right. These we're not going to vote government. our way to freedom. Yeah. You're not going to suddenly like, oh, my gosh, like my reason for being is finally OK because we're not materialists. We don't think this life is all we have. Right. And right. we think that actually our struggles and some of the challenges presented to us, whether we're having a good day or a bad day, there's purpose in it. And it's meant it's meant for my salvation. Um, so there's a very different way of looking at the world as opposed to people who are like, this life is all you have. And if you don't get enough stuff now, that was your one chance to get stuff or that was your one chance to have peace. And, and so, you know, we see this as like, you know, life is like the, the pinprick that delivers the medicine that saves you forever. It's like life is, it's, these are momentary suffering and, um, and that actually a lot of, a lot of what's happening that we don't like to us is probably better for us than the things we like that are happening to us. So right. it's a very different perspective. So um, you're not waiting for like some guy to get elected. And now I could, Oh, finally I can have a life. Like I get really, I got really frustrated during 2020 when my kid's school is shut down and like my, my young kids who need socialization can't get it. Right. I moved, I literally moved to Florida. I was like a political refugee. 
um, <laughs> because they were was where? open. Were you, was open. Were you we're in, in Louisville? No, it was so weird. Oh, we're in Louisville. Louisville. Yeah. yeah, we were in Louisville, and uh, it just got locked down so hard, and everything was masks, and and it, it was just there was little hotlines you could rat out your neighbors if you saw them doing something. Oh my gosh! And like, yeah, so it was it was stupid. Um, and then there was a lot of protesting going on. Downtown was getting destroyed, and nobody was doing anything about it. And uh, and so I did something about it. So I, I went where I would be, our family would be treated better. So I understand the frustration with like when things don't go well politically. I get that. At the same time, ultimately, that was this was all useful to um, building building us up as people. Like mm. you have to see everything that happens to you as something useful. Otherwise, you're gonna just you're only can be happy when things are going your way. And, um, and not even that being happy is so important, but, you know, having a life that seems to have meaning or that God is moving you towards something better. Right. Um, and, and it's not always better in your flesh. And, you know, sometimes it is, but it's not always better like that. So, yeah. um, you know, so I think that that uh, I think that really helps. But in the in the story, in the sense of the story, it's that there's it, the world. The part of what happened in the world is they've created the system through psychedelics now. And now the you can't talk about the past anymore. You can see a little of this happening already because in the past is they have to villainize the past, everything about it, right? It was like, oh, thank God we've yep. gotten to where we've gotten, you know? Yeah, and thank God women aren't oppressed by the patriarchy and uh, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, so in this world, this is how this is how um, the Logos finds its way back in, if you want to mm. put it that way, is that yeah. um, the only, there's still a need for humor and entertainment, so the only way they can be funny is they can't make, you can't have a jester who makes fun of the king like they used to. Like the jester, like, so the symbolism of the jester is sort of like he was, the king was going to have all of these stories told about him. He was going to be mocked. The king was going to be mocked. Nothing you can do about it. There's There were two ways to handle that. You can go try to chase down everyone that mocks you and make them afraid, which is impossible, especially in an ancient world. Um, or you can bring in your own guy who does it, and you and then once you can take the joke, it diffuses everybody else. You know, uh, it diffuses all the other jokes because it's like, oh, this guy's got a sense of humor about himself, or you know, or this these are the the approved versions of that. So the only right. function of the past in the story is through mockery, and mm. so that's what made me think of the story of Perfarios in the mime is that uh, you know that he comes out to mock a baptism. And he finds his baptismal service and he comes out to enact it and baptizes himself and it actually works. So like the truth finds it back, it's, it's way back into the world through a joke. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that's part of, that's a big part of the story. Well, and, um, and I've, I've talked a little bit, I've done streams on why the left can't meme, which is a meme of itself, right? right? And why comedy is dying because there has to be some type of validity behind, behind any joke. That's why it's yeah. funny. That's why a group of people with diverse ethnic backgrounds and political opinions can all laugh at a joke together because at some level it resonates with reality at a, as a truth and so yeah. christ is the truth capital t and therefore I, I think that's so that's so funny how the counterculture is right of center now and comedy is like right of center and regards they're all to conservatives how like world. secretly most of them at least they, even some people that it, don't even joke like that when you talk to them in real life they're just they're pretty based yeah. um it's because that's so that's where the outsider is now right so the yeah. you can think of it like like the left and the right are two pr perspectives that can flip we don't use those terms properly anymore like in the sense True. that um the right is the thing that's established right? The thing that's been established, the tradition, and the left is that which is supposed to renew that tradition. And so they're all out of balance in politics because um, you can't spend half your time renewing your tradition. Like that's not, it doesn't make sense. Um, it's really more like its function of the world should be more like a right hand and a left hand is that, mm -hmm. you know, a smaller percentage of the world is left-handed, but it brings, it brings about a certain kind of surprise and a, in a certain perspective that, um, that we would need. Um, and especially, especially if things become too stultified and too cut off from anything new, uh, it starts to die. Um, so the, there's, there's, there's symbolism in renewal. Renewal needs to happen. That's what the left is supposed to do. It's supposed to renew, um, the right protects tradition. So the problem is, is that when the culture war, the culture, really, when you saw the left get actually conservative like they're actually functioning in a way where they're trying to conserve something now as opposed to just break down those walls right true, so when true. in the culture war when they took the seat now they're the conservatives right so people right. like me who are of a liberal mindset see all the opportunity in in different places than where they're pushing um so this is how flips happen that's that's how people um that, that's how we keep seeing this flip happen because there's yeah. no 
there's no joke in the thing that's established unless you can make fun of it. Um, so that's part of it too, but also in the sense that if you think about the polarity of the world, like left and right have more to do with north and south and east and west. Um, well, I can tease at this for people who are into symbolism in the sense that the, you can go east forever. You can always head towards the sun around the world. You can keep walking east forever. You can walk west forever. There's just like the heavens. The heavens have no end to it. And, you know, the earth has no bottom to it, really, at the end of reality. It goes and it goes and goes. But the left and north and south have a, you know, if you walk towards the North Pole, eventually you start walking towards the South Pole. And this is right. what we see in politics is that like you see someone who's like, oh, I'll show them. Um, I'll show them we'll become abstinent, you know, if they're not going to let us have abortions. It's like. Do you understand what you just said? You like literally, exactly. you literally just, you, you, you got to the top of the world and you kept walking and now you're heading South. Like it's, this is exactly what happened because the positions themselves. Yeah. The end, shift. yeah yep. They keep, they keep floating back and forth. So in our story, so one of the things, okay. So you get more, I need to question you about a couple things before, cause I got a little time left here. Um, if you do. So mm -hmm. psychedelics, you have, I've never done a psychedelic in my life on purpose. Okay. If I've ever done one, like if someone never slipped me something, I wouldn't know it because I'm so weird already. It probably, you know, <laughs> I'm already there. Like, um, so there's a, okay. So let's talk about addiction in general. Like this is there or false bridges. So totalitarianism, like the idea is they think culture should be a certain way. The world should be a certain way, or it's just for the world to be a certain way. And they do it by force. The problem is, is that we become socially dumber because now we're not developing a voluntary way to love each other, right? Right. A voluntary way to care for each other. No, we must be forced to love each other. Now we're actually losing the skills that allow us to connect and love each other because it's being coerced. So there's something like this that happens. Let's say alcoholism. Like there's like two opposing um, emotional categories. One would be despair and one would be euphoria. So despair is like you're in your body. You don't want to be in your body. <laughs> Everything's terrible. There's no hope. Euphoria is this, you know, detached experience from that. It's, it's getting above your body. It's everything feels good. And uh, you don't have a care in the world. So, you know, let's just take something simple like we deal with in the song Enchante, like, like alcohol, is it's a bad plan to solve despair because you become, if you want to say it like in a Vervakian way, cognitively weaker. Right. By solving the problem that way. Like you move, you, you find, you find a way to jump, take a bridge. You, you get on the Bifrost and you take a bridge to Asgard. You take a bridge to uh, euphoria. And then when you come back down, the problem is, is that you feel worse. The alcohol actually has a depressing quality and you haven't gotten smarter and you haven't gained any, any dominion over your life or anything. Um, so you end up weaker. So psychedelics, I think I feel like there's something like this happening because I've only in my experience with psychedelics is through friends of mine who are intelligent friends who've used psychedelics. And I knew it before they ever told me because they had a certain type of insight that they couldn't connect. Like they had this experience that they had no way to get back to without help. Right. 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 And um, so this is, you know, this happens in medicine. It's like, hey, don't change your lifestyle. We'll just give you a pill, right? There's this right. bridge where you're actually getting weaker, and then eventually the pill stops working over time. So my understanding of it from an outsider when I'm watching it, it seems like that same, it seems like a the same problem you have with all other drugs, even though it has a different effect and a different appeal. Right. It seems to be like a, you didn't actually gain any wisdom. You didn't really gain anything because there's no way to embody it because you have no path of getting there. Like you, you haven't learned like, uh, you haven't learned the the steps and the proper wisdom to carry you forward to that. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, I would agree with that. I think psychedelics, one of the reasons why they're so popular and most specifically in the Western world is because our world lacks mysticism. And so mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a mysticism and a piece of paper and a mushroom and a bottom of a glass ayahuasca ceremony or uh, of a pipe, a DMT. And so people can access this sort of mystical reality. Very, very rarely are there cases of anybody having a high dose psychedelic experience that maintained an atheistic outlook. Hmm. So therefore, it opens up the possibility that hmm, maybe there is like a spiritual reality that's adjacent to us and present with us right now as we speak. And I think it, it does that. It kind of shakes people open. But like you said, it's also a, a neotenizing effect. It keeps people in a juvenile state because the whole point is to embody virtue, especially from a, an Orthodox Christian perspective. 
And the psychedelics allow you, I, for lack of a better term, a sort of Buddhist understanding, like Zen Buddhism believes in like Satori, like these brief momentary glimpses into insight, into nothingness, into nirvana. And that's kind of what psychedelics do is they, they give you these brief glimpses into something that is transcendent, emotional, uh, but then what do you do with it and how is that interpreted? And for many of the psychedelic people, you know, that I think the addiction because psychedelics, at least from what I've seen, tryptamines are not psychologically addictive or, or by a lot, you know, physically, yeah, addictive, physically addictive, but yeah. they are, I would say, spiritually addictive because people form a relationship with them that believe that they can't access the non-physical realm without those because the, mm. they become addicted to the shimmer, the lights the ecstatic emotions that you get when you, you know, your central nervous system is disturbed by a psychedelic substance. Now you feel the sense of euphoria that lasts for two hours. And so now they believe in a way, going back to what you're talking about with the Protestants in regards to these ecstatic states of emotionalism is necessary for uh, worship. Therefore, uh oh, I'm at the Colts game and I'm worshiping harder here right. than I am at my Hillsong church. Yeah. Um, psychedelics kind of place people in that same camp now they're not christian oriented but this idea that worship spiritual insight is some ecstatic bodily experience i think again neotenizes them it, it keeps them in mm. a juvenile state and they don't really go seeking because the more difficult path some people believe that sort of psychedelics are like a shortcut i don't you know maybe for some people uh but the shortcut is so short-lived so it, it, it right. doesn't it, like you said, once they come down, maybe they saw something insightful that that is objectively true. But what are they going to do with it and how are they going to put that into a praxis within their life? That's why you need mm. tradition. And I think then in psychedelics and the spiritual, not religious appeals to the Western sentiments of consumerism, because now you can just go to the buffet of spiritual ideas and practices and rituals and you can pick all the ones that fit you with who you are right now. Yeah, but that's that's not really tradition. So it's like, well, I have tradition. I wear a Navajo, you know, sweatshirt that was sewn right there in New Mexico. And I I you know, I do Buddhist Zen chants and I pray my rosary. It's like, no, dude, that's not tradition. And that's not yeah. you conforming to anything that actually forces you to grow outside yourself. And so it leads ultimately back to the fall of Lucifer is it's just self-worship. Mm. Yeah, oh, I, I see that. And two, so part of the problem is that there are, so I had a friend who, like, I, I think, I'm probably getting the story a little bit wrong, but it, it, the short version of it is that he dropped something, looked at a picture of a taco, and thought of the Theotokos, and started to understand um, the tacos. <laughs> the theo I don't know, it's the weirdest story, right? But, like, again, something was pulled good out of it. And I think there's something... I, so the problem is, is that, you know, C.S. Lewis points this out pretty well, is that there's a, the the devil has a problem with the fact that we can take pleasure even in sin, because yeah. pleasure points to God. Like, not that misused pleasure points to God, but the fact that God made a world that was pleasing. Like, so people don't understand, like, why, why does, why is sex this sought after thing? And there's a real loving message from God in that. He wants you to know that his joy in your existence and, and being brought into being and what it, right. his joy in creation, right? It's like a beautiful romantic poem that's happening. And it's a, it's, you know, there's, it's, it does participate like a ritual in that, like for a husband and wife making children. And, um, and there's a reason why it's not just like the evolutionary scientist says like, Oh, this is here. So you'll do it. It's like, no, like there's always a better story at the end of it. And so, Two, I think there's something about the insights, though, that happened. So basically, you can do anything. You could be anywhere. Like, you know, you could use the woman who's caught in adultery that uh, Jesus tells the Pharisee, or the, you know, them not to don't cast the first stone. Like, you yeah. know, if you haven't, if you've sinned, uh, you're without sin, you can cast the first stone. Um, he doesn't, that that isn't like a recipe to like, oh, if I go out and commit adultery now, Christ is going to meet me. And he might, yeah. he might, you know, but I mean, that that can happen in anything. So uh, it's not really an argument for psychedelics because it goes well sometimes either. Right. Yeah. I always say God can meet you anywhere because uh, my last psychedelic major psychedelic experience was an ayahuasca ceremony in Joshua Tree, California, mm -hmm. in which uh, the ayahuasca, the message to me was it was time for me to follow Christ and become a builder and build. That's why I started Church of the Eternal Logos full time and gave up promoting the psychedelics and everything that I was doing. Hmm. And um, 
but at the same time, and the ayahuasca stopped working. This was the phenomenon that really threw me for a conundrum is that for the first time in uh, a decade of taking high dose psychedelics, I'm at an ayahuasca ceremony and the ayahuasca just shut off like somebody flipped a switch. And wow. it was right after it was, it was for, you know, the message was for me to follow, follow Christ and, and, and be a builder, not a consumer. And, yeah. um, and that, so it's like, well, I say that to people, and then I hear people who are pro psychedelics. They see, see the psychedelic. And I was like, no, dude, it's not the psychedelic right. that did it. God met me where I needed to be met because where else could He have met me? If He met me when I was sober or, or when I was at an Orthodox church, I'd said, yeah, but the psychedelics, you know, I, I I do these things and I have these experiences. He met me at the height of what I what I was worshiping, and then showed me that it was time for me to grow up and turn away from it. That's how God can meet us anywhere. That's not that the psychedelics led me to God. Right. So like Paul, he made you blind to the psychedelics and you came back down to earth. Um, right. And uh, while you're heading somewhere else, that's really interesting. Um, two, I think there's something too about the insights themselves. Like when I hear people describe them. So there's this uh, story, I think it's in Mark chapter eight, uh, where someone, they bring a blind person to Christ to heal and he takes him outside the city and he spits in his, he spits in his eyes and then touches them. And the mm -hmm. guy opens his eyes and he says, uh, I see men as trees walking, right? There's something not right about the way he's seeing. Never mind the fact that how does this guy know what a tree looks like? Um, but never mind that. Like he says this and then Christ puts his hands back on his eyes and he sees properly. Now it's followed. Okay. So you, you might, we might be mistaken to think that there's like a higher type of sight we could have. That like actually right. he was seeing too high. And I thought about this for a while and I realized that the the passage directly after that is when Christ asked the disciples, who do you think I am? And it, it mirrors the same exact pattern. He says, mm. uh, who do you think I am? And some are like, hey, some say John the Baptist, some say this prophet, right? They kind of give him these lower examples, right? Okay, and then Christ says, um, you know, Christ says no, like Peter actually finally says, uh, no, you're the Christ, right? And he's And he says, tell no one of this. And now the blind man, just before that, the same pattern in the story said, tell no one of this. So these two stories that are like literally the same length have the same pattern. So there's something that happens at the end of the, the blind man story. If you miss this detail, you kind of miss the idea. It's that when Christ goes to put his hands on the, his eyes the second time, he, he has them look up, right? So it's not, he's not like looking around and trying to understand things on this horizontal plane. Like who are the other people you could be like Christ? It's like up, higher. So I feel like there's something there might be something in the way the vision is actually delivered that mm. it's an invitation. It's an invitation to actually be prideful about thinking you're high, you're yes. seeing, and but actually it's it's trapping you at a lower place. Absolutely, of insight. Absolutely, I, I because you look at the behavioral patterns of what I deem psychedelic mysticism or psychedelic spirituality, which is a uh, conglomerate of a lot of different things there's not a single thing just like gnosticism isn't but you look at what they promote and it's um you know down with the patriarchy radical forms of sexuality uh orgiastic activity mm -hmm. and i'm not here to disparage anybody but again from a christian perspective we would see oh well it looks like everything that the psychedelics what they do once they really formulate this as a central part of their spirituality is they want to cross all the boundaries that we then are trying to maintain order with Right. And this is then seen as a sort of progressive advancement in society or whatnot. Um, but it always leads back to the worship of their own selves. And there's no objective standard. So I had an open panel. Do, do psychedelics lead to enlightenment? I had all these psychedelic people come on and try to tell me that they do. And I said, OK, well, then what enlightenment? How do you know if you're enlightened? And it begs the question because you know you're in line because you believe in all the things that psychedelic people believe in. And yeah, that you're right, 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 right. <laughs> because yeah, yeah, there's yeah. no objective standard. Yeah, because you now like the movie The Wall better. Um, <laughs> yeah. Pink Floyd. So oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, okay, because like there's, there's I, I think people need to be concerned about this. Um, I think people need to be more concerned about this pattern developing because it will, like, so Verveke might be he he might be heading towards that when he's talking about the AI that the AI is going to lift us. It's there's this flat materialistic perspective where they have kind of a pseudo verticality to their thinking, and um, they are going to look for means to naturally through naturalism or something to try to create this spiritual experience, whether it's through you know the perfect counselor in AI. Or whether it's through right. the idea that, again, uh, it's, it's to the idea that 
oh, we if we expose you to these things at the right time and in the right dose, we can make things appear as divine that actually aren't. Right. Um, you know, so I think there's something of like of like the pattern of the Antichrist in this, in the sense that there's um, you know, there's like two things that happen in the same time in that story. It's like this weird pattern you see in the Bible, like where you see like Leviathan and Behemoth. Like one's like the chaotic potentiality of the of sea, like this irresistible force, and then the land, which is like this immovable object behemoth. Like right. the totalizing force that just clamps down and doesn't let you move and makes a wall you can't get through, and then this other force that's, you know, that breaks you down into multiplicity and chaos. And you see that in Revelation, like those two patterns brought out through like ones like the pattern of the beast, which is this totalizing, like weaponized masculinity. And right. then this weaponized femininity, which is, you know, be like you see this all everywhere. God bless. God bless the world. You're talking about guys needing help. Of course, girls need help yep. because they're being Both. so they're being encouraged that like, oh, here's your beauty is there to farm attention for yourself. Right. And to and right because you, it works, it works. They get attention, and and people think they need attention. Of course, that 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 becomes a harder and harder void to fill. Um, yep. As opposed to beauty is supposed to ennoble the world. Like it's supposed to. Hey, you get to you you get to move closer towards this if you're noble, if you uh you know if you behave well, if you protect me. Like all these things that the, the feminine might ask of the of the masculine, they kind of get beauty backwards. So you have this pattern, and so what we're moving into is the ability to, to have more totalizing control, to really know everything you you do. And in fact, like um, if you, if you want to think that my priest said this, this way, it's like uh, the demons don't know you're thinking until you type it into Google. <laughs> and I was like, dude, that's pretty good. I'm going to use that. That's pretty good. Like in the sense that they've, they figured out a way like to get all of what was in your secret chambers out into yeah. their purview right and so they're not it's not just like some antichrist totalizing it's like every evil spirit well, in the world is totalizing well, control father right? deacon dr ananias <clears throat> and i were, were speculating on this privately about the inversion of the noetic realm and so orthodoxy mm -hmm. teaches that your imagination is the point in which spiritual temptation and uh, communion or activity with demons occurs yeah. And so or, the saints are, and the fathers are always warning you about mental images, mental images. And we've all experienced this. You'll go somewhere, you're standing on the edge of a building, all of a sudden you get a mental image that, hey, just jump, just right. jump. Or, you know, hold hold your brand new phone out, outside the window, you know, just crazy yeah, stuff. Where do, this, but, where do these voices come from? Yeah. Right. And so the orthodoxy says, well, this is the demonic warfare. These are the little gizmi. And Father Deacon Doctor and I were talking about well, with all because my PhD, what I'm writing about is transhumanism and uh, technological divinization mm. and comparing that with theosis of, of orthodoxy. And we were talking about how all this digital technology, what it's doing is it's materializing the noetic realm because mm. the noose in the noetic realm is non-physical, but it's 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 making it physical. It's creating a domain in which it now has its own sort of ecosystem in the world. And so when you're talking about putting your thoughts into Google, that's really what it's doing. It's a it's a sort of material manifestation. So now you can be anywhere at once. You know, only in your yeah. imagination can you think about being in China right now. But now through the noetic inverted realm of tech digital technology, you can be in China right now. You know, you yeah. can pull up images or whatnot. And so thinking about how and I, I speculate and I've laid this out for various priests uh, within the Orthodox world. Um, privately, and, and many have been somewhat supportive, some have sort of questioned it, but I wonder about this whole sentient AI. I do not believe an AI can become sentient because it, it violates my understanding of anthropology. Yeah, I don't yeah. believe uh, inter highly interconnectedness equals being sentient. But what I do think as an Orthodox Christian is that the Antichrist and all this digital technology is a sort of inversion of the satanic incarnation and so satan can't take on a human body he can't have uh an incarnation like christ but he can inhabit the technology the inverted noose the in inverted noetic realm which yeah. he already is in right that's the realm that we both share with the demons is the noetic realm wow that's your man you blow my mind that's so spot on i think i think uh i think what you said is super insightful um i think if people can understand that it's very help. it could be very helpful to them and engaging these things too, uh, because the imagination is also the means by which the devil uses to get us to give things the wrong name. Like if you go all the way back to Eden, um, part of like my friend Richard Roland, uh, Roland talks about this, uh, the sacramental imagination, which is inverting the imagination to remember the things that are actually connect the heavens and the earth. 
um, mm. as opposed to because that's what we're trying. That's what I feel like we're we're recovering from is that, uh, you know, uh, we, I don't have I really don't have time to get into the song Fever Dream, but I kind of deal with this in Fever Dream, whereas I use Cain as the example. Like Cain, not only can he not a- name the animals, he can't find an animal um, because he doesn't he's he's disconnected so far from God that he can't get even food from the ground, right? There's this, he's lost in, um, he's lost in this. And you can see this happening in our culture where we've gotten so far from the real names of things. And technology is part yes. of the wedge that puts us away from that. Like it's it's through the existence of birth control that we're now for the first time ever able to stop thinking of sex as something that's both pleasuring and, um, and procreative, right? right? So once the procreation is dis- uh, separated from that, now you can name it anything. The problem I would I would leave people with is this is that because we can technologically solve some of the material problems that go along with these things, um, it only amplifies the spiritual problem. Um, you know, uh, so the the so for example, we don't like like I said before, like the guy who doesn't go out and act on his sin because he's a leader in a church and he loses clout or he loses his reputation, or the idea that I could give you money to stop doing something you're you'd want to stop doing and you haven't been able to figure out how to stop doing it before is that the material world does have a sense of at the very bottom of reality for the lowest reasons of if we pay attention to reality, it's actually pinning us in. If we can just pay attention to the cause and effect of that level, you might actually come up with an emergent morality right. that's closer to the the re- revealed morality. Yeah. Um, but when technology removes that, right, removes these consequences from us, um, it becomes harder and harder to ima- reimagine the proper names for things. And which yeah. is why I think, I think that Peugeot gets this right when he says, um, go to church. They'd be like, like his, like when he said, what are you, like, what do you do about this? How do I do this? What do I, he's like, go to church. Go to it's church. Like, that's, that's it. Like that you go right. to church. And, um, and you, you, when he's saying that from an Orthodox perspective, because I've gone to churches that it's the same problem in there as it is everywhere else in Orthodoxy is where you actually get to reconnect your own heavens and earth internally, your own body and your spirit. Um, right. So that's been, that's been the the gift and contrary to like what everybody who follows me, who gets worried about that, like it, it's like, it's it, people who are worried, like let's say on the left, they're worried about compassion and acceptance. Um, I, I will, t- I don't care what you are or what you call yourself, what you identify with. You can come to church with me tomorrow. I will yeah. proudly stand next to you and yep. I will not judge you because I got problems. I have besetting problems with me. I've been working on and you do too, but like the problem yep. is you're dealing with the same thing is that without without going to church, you're going to be trying to reinvent something that there's you're you don't have enough access to the good already to reinvent on right. your own. Um yep. so I mean that's what I have to say. I have so much more I want to talk yep. to you about, but well, I actually have to I, go in a second. Okay. Uh well, I just want to make one comment right there. And if you do have a yep. minute, we can finish up. I know we have a few questions and some super chats. Okay, you got um it. that um yeah, when you're talking about the names of things, it makes me think again of of what exactly magic is about, and it has to do with the manipulation, and the power of words. God created the universe by speaking it into existence, and and that's what ritualistic magic is about. That's what uh, the the seal of Solomon is about: is the names of the seventy two demons, so that you can command them to act once you have the name. And so when we look mm. at the the contemporary world, it you know the I'm not a huge fan, but Alfred Kurzybski, he's the father of general semantics, a linguistic scholar, and he re- he coined the term, the map is not the territory, meaning the the symbols that we use, the language that we use is not the territory of the actual, you know, the word desk is not the actual desk. However, the map, I would say as Orthodox Christians, we would say the map is the territory because words do have a direct uh, relation and correlation to the world that is. And what they're doing is I would argue that it actually is a magical process. It's, it's that what we're in right now is they're redefining words and maps, social justice. Mm-hmm. Well, what's wrong with justice? Well, we need social justice. And then it creates a new definition, which is really about injustice against uh, certain groups of people. Yeah. And so this is a magical process about manipulating the linguistic map we we utilize so that people at an unconscious level are already working then inside that territory, which is mm. a different territory than the world that actually exists. Yeah. And that's why they can't recognize God because they, they really do live in a fantasy land, a fantasy land that's constructed by language and ideas. Yeah, no, I mean, and there's, it's, it's a long road out. It's a long road out. Uh, you know, if you have, 
I, I pray for people that are in this because like they're, they're really, sometimes there's, you, you meet up with people, there's no path for you to, to, to help them. You see their struggle, right. you see they're lost. Uh, and they're, they're defending the thing that's actually destroying them. And it's like, okay, well, what can I do? It's like, well, thank God prayer works, right? You know, <laughs> exactly. Uh, thank God. You know, someone out there on the outside is like, whatever. Thanks for thoughts and prayers. It didn't help me at all. It's like, no, you have no idea. You have um, no idea how real no that idea. is. Yeah. So no I, I, just in regards to your time, I just want to run through these real quick. Chase yeah, Haggard, sure. a fellow Orthodox musician, um, he said, glory to God for more Orthodox musicians. Can't wait to catch this stream when I'm free and check out Neil's music. Make sure to support musicians who put out positive art by listening to their music, checking out their merch and sharing their tunes. Well, thank you so much, Chase Haggard. God bless you, brother. Uh, really appreciate it. And then we had a couple super chats over on Dono Chat. Um, one came from Bon Jovi 1912, no message. Well, thank you so much, Bon Jovi 1912, for the generous $50, $50 super chat. Um, four dollars comes in for I, Dave Jones, who says, Is beauty objective or subjective or a combination of both? And that was level that was a question for both of us. I don't know if you want to take a stab at that first. Is beauty right. objective or subjective or both? I'll go quickly. I think if it's if it's beauty with a capital B, it's objective, right? Yep. Now there's things that you might find appealing, and and there might be it might be participating in beauty in a way it might be misguided. Um, so I mean, people find certain things very attractive, um, but they might find that those beauties are closer to lust, um, you know, something like that. Uh, I think that um, it's important to understand, like when people like, even if you go through like the Old Testament law or something like that, if you if you read it and you think it's of a list as do and don't, you kind of miss part of the point in the sense that there's no, I don't know if I have a word high enough to say this, but there's something about like the church scripture and the way the logos is functioning in the world where it's helping you form good taste. Mm -hmm. Um, and good taste is too low of a word. Cause when people think of taste, they think of, you know, all these idiosyncratic things that people like. Uh, but there is such a thing as good taste. There is a, there is the ability to recognize when something's well-formed and ill-formed. Um, so I would say that the beauty you should be most concerned about in the world is that which transcends and is objective and has a capital B. And then you let Absolutely. you pursue that beauty and you let it fill in. Uh, you let it fill in the ethics. I haven't read it. I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to see that guy like uh, uh, Sunday. Oh, uh, that's a great book. I do recommend it to uh, Davy Jones. If you haven't, you can check out the ethics of beauty. This is a great Orthodox perspective on Batista's. beauty and how we relate to it and understand it. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with your, with your assessment as well. Five uh, Z throws in $5 and says more cowbell. I want to hear that utopian dung fueled world of firebird. <laughs> All right, that guy's name is Dougie, um, and he's insane. He's a, he's a <laughs> he, he's chaotic. Uh, he's a he's a chaotic good uh, fool who follows us. I love him. Um, hey, well, his channel is pretty years. wild. If you go, you want to see some, you want to see some stuff. It, go to his channel, Five Z. All right, I'll check um, it out. Thank you, Five yeah. Z, for the support, and you're more than welcome here, brother. Uh, Jared Fetzer, also an Orthodox musician, says, "Do you think music is the best put in an apocalyptic apocalyptic narrative form?" This is what I've been concluding. I find that a song when written should mean everything it can. And the only limit should be the amount of words and musical composition. Listen, I think he's gone to, onto something there. I don't want to, I don't want to flesh that out um, too much for him. I think, um, I think the beautiful thing that people are starting to waking up to in the world is again, like this ex escape from this flat worldview, the idea that um, even in mythologizing of, of the logos, like even in, even in participating in things that might even seem like mythology to the outsider, there's a way to, to point back to the fact that you're not a random creation. You're, you're made with reason and the things that happen in your life. Like I could talk about this forever. Like why does the moon have a 28 day cycle? Like a woman, like why does the, you know, uh, the, we can talk about the sun. We can talk about the sense of humans. Everything has meaning and everything is packed into the story. So I think any musician who can tap into the real story that is, um, undergirding all of reality uh, yeah. and you start to present that um poetically to people it's going to even they're not going to even necessarily know what you're talking about but they're going to get a lump in their throat you know they're going to get yeah. chills on their arms stuff stuff's going to happen so uh for us just in my natural language of talking is the apocalyptic meaning that i i look back to the garden of eden as the story to help us understand our nature and uh what's going on in this world and i look to the eschaton to see where things are actually going. And if my story participates in these two things, I have good apocalyptic literature. 
Yeah. A glory so. to God. Uh, next one came from Melchizedek again. God bless you, brother, for uh, your two super chats. He throws in ten dollars and says, "What hope do you have for this music to wake people up to what time it is in the world, and how does that play back into the church? Basically, why should we bother with art when we could simply pray?" Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, he, you know, so I think Solomon deals with this subject a lot in the world. Is that um, is that there's all kinds of ways that okay, so like if, for example. Um, if I just start talking about Jesus with someone and I don't explain who Jesus is, then the name itself doesn't help anybody. Um, now there are certain things, if you hear a squeaky toy in the background, that's my dog. Um, so, uh, <laughs> it's not my shoes, my clown shoes. Um, so anyway, the, uh, yeah, so there is a long way to talk about it. Like, but for example, like we can talk about hesychasm on YouTube, something like that. It's, it's yeah. going to be mocked and not understood if you're outside of the tradition. Like the idea that right. someone's learning to pray without ceasing the Jesus prayer in their head. And there's maybe even yeah. a breathing pattern. So it's just nonsense to people. So you have to think about what people know. You have to be a little bit more like, if you're going to be an artist, you gotta be a little more like Paul. Um, when he goes and talks about the statue of the unknown God, where he finds something that people have in commonality to it. The Christians have done this forever. This is why so much of Christian has been a rescuing of paganism when they go into areas where they right. look for the ways because everything for it to work must participate in the truth in some way or another, even if they mean it for evil. And if you can notice the truth in that, you now have a commonality and a point you can talk about something better and something right. deeper and something more meaningful. Yeah, I love that. <clears throat> and last super chat, and I'll let you go, Neil. Uh, $50. Shout out to Hose B. Hose B throws in $50 and says, Hey man, I've been binging your channel and absolutely love your videos, but they have completely turned my Protestant worldview on its head and it's a bit of a scary place to be in, but this is how we grow. So I want to thank you very much for your content. Well, thank you very much, Hose B, for that. God bless you, brother. Um, and uh, feel free to, to stick around and be part of the community. We'd love to have you. And thank you so much for the support. No, he's in a good place, place for that. that. Yeah. Neil, thank you so much, brother, for coming on. This was great. I didn't mean to hold you so long, but uh, no just problem. The, the way yeah, if you could just put some goes. links in the description for her, like, you know, our website right, might yeah. be a good spot to find us on all yep. our socials, Dirt Poor Robins. And then again, if you want to come see us, we're, we're going to be doing some shows next year. One of the big ones is our our release we're doing at the Symbolic World Summit. That's going to be dope. That's going to have uh, Jonathan Pichot, uh, Martin Shaw. Um, who else is there? Oh, yeah. Um, Father uh, Stephen DeYoung. He's awesome. Okay. Yeah. Um, he's the giant slayer himself. And uh Vesper Samper and myself, we're gonna be there. And so we're doing it's gonna be a really unique conference. And uh, you should definitely come and hang out with us. Sounds good. Well, yeah. God bless you and the family. Wish you guys nothing but the best. And yeah, you bet. Hopefully we can talk again one day. This was fun, man. Yeah, absolutely. We got to do it again. This was a lot of fun, and yeah. we can uh dive a little bit deeper into more specific topics instead of just a wide-ranging overview of things. But I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, guys, uh, I'll share their link again here in the live chat. I've already done that and I'll post all their links in the video description. So I will be back uh, Sunday or Monday. So as always until next time, God bless. <laughs>